I'd like to call this meeting of the Bedford County Board of Supervisors to order and welcome everyone here tonight. Um, I don't see any hats on, so that's good. If you have a cell phone, if you could please silence it or put it on vibrate. Um, and then I will go over some instructions regarding citizens' comment and public hearings in a little bit during our agenda. But right now, let's begin with a moment of silence. Thank you. If you'd stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> all right. Thank you. All right. We've uh, all got a copy of the agenda here. Are there any questions regarding the agenda? If not, I'd entertain a motion to adopt agenda. So moved. Second. All right. Motion by Ms. Parker, seconded by Mr. Johnson. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And that passes. <clears throat> all right. Next up is our citizen comment period. We've got a lot of people signed up for different things, so I want to lay a little ground rules here. We only have um, four public hearings tonight. Those public hearings are the ordinance regarding, uh, on behalf of Jacob Burbach, we've got the Viridian properties, we have the um, animal update, and we have the farm machinery and farm implements. Those are the only public hearings tonight. If you signed up thinking there was something else, AKA short-term rentals, that is not tonight. That is an action item. That only calls for a resolution to set the public hearing. So <clears throat> I'm gonna go through a couple of things about citizen comments. Um, you have three minutes. Um, we will allot up to a minimum of 15 minutes for those that have signed up. You may not yield your time to any other speaker. You need to clearly state your name and your voting district. Um, you are prohibited from addressing issues that are on an upcoming public hearing, either by our board or the Planning Commission. If you speak on something that we have scheduled for a public hearing in the next 90 days, you get one bite at the apple you will not get the chance to speak at that public hearing. So if you speak during citizen comment period tonight on something that we've scheduled, you will not be allowed to speak at the next public hearing within 90 days. Um, if you have previously spoken on a particular subject in the last three months, you can't readdress it to us again tonight. Um, for the benefit of those online, you may submit written statements for citizen comments and they will be handed out to the board members. They will not be read into the record. They will become a, pop, a, a part of the public record. When we get to the citizen comment, I mean the public hearing part, I'll give you some more instructions on that. Uh, I'm just trying to guess who is what here. So if I have to ask you to clarify what you have signed up to speak for, just forgive me. I think the majority of you are here on item 8A. So our citizen comment time, there's a clock right there that's gonna keep your time for three minutes. It will blink. Do not be offended if I stop you if you go past your three minutes because that's gonna be the rule for everybody. So our first one that has signed up for a marked public hearing, but there is no public hearing on 9A tonight, so that will be a citizen comment. Steve Pitcher. I took, two, I took two days off of work to come here because I thought the discussion was this. I asked you know, uh, Jordan Mitchell if it was gonna be up tonight. I was told yes, I defer until it actually comes up because it'll be a waste of my time to do that, but now I've spent two more days 
And I'm sorry that I'm annoyed now because I took two days off of work. Things are going well, I think, with Mitchell Jordan and you know, with what he's trying to do here. So I'm just pleased that we're all working together, I think, now. But you know, a lot of us came here to, to speak on this thinking that it was that 9A was going to be discussed. So I don't know how we can prevent that from occurring again so that we don't. Well, it would be marked as a public hearing on the agenda. You can discuss it tonight, but you won't get a no, chance I'd, in it. I'd rather come when, when it's actually up for discussion. And, you know, it, it's just a waste, I think, of our time now because I don't think it will be, in, you know, incorporated. So. Mr. Chairman, I don't think it's ever been announced that it was a public hearing. No, no. it has not. Only by some misinformation that's been floating around the lake. I saw a sign out on the road that said it was, but no agenda or nothing. Never. Really never was. Okay, well, but anyway. this communication between us. I talk to the people who put signs together. That's where the okay. information is. All right. So I'm going to write deferred on that. Um, I have Paula picture. Is that the same for Paula? All right. And then I have. Okay. thought this was on the agenda but first of all I'm sad I'm sad I have to be here once again fighting for our quality of life here in Bedford County yet feeling like we're not being heard as a full-time resident I'd like to quickly present some facts that have occurred in our neighborhood from April 15th to June 1st this year all events have occurred in one short-term rental dwelling that has four bedrooms but has been renting for over capacity week one 13 people with three small children on Saturday, April 15th, drinking, smoking, cursing, loud singing with karaoke machines, yelling at boaters driving by, drunken teenagers passed out in the yard, cursing, F this, B, the B word, aggressive behavior to our dog. This continued on for hours until we had to call the rental company, the owner of the house, of the short-term rental, and local authorities. Week two, different family, same dwelling. Our neighbor who lives on the other side of this house has two small children witnessed and recorded an altercation that involved local police making, making an arrest. Week three, different family, 13 people in the same dwelling. Overwhelmed trash cans, they were moved up alongside our neighborhood road with bags of trash along our road to put to the point where birds and animals scattered the trash throughout our neighborhood. All of these things have pictures and they have been recorded. Um, all of this from one dwelling in a matter of a few weeks. Increased water pollution, increased land pollution, increased noise and criminal activity. This does not count for a different dwelling in our same neighborhood with three bedrooms that advertises and rents for 16 plus people and had 27 people over three days and three nights and this was approved by the owner. My husband and I have two have children. We have two very young grandchildren, and we have made the, our children have made recent changes because of this behavior in our neighborhood. We cannot even go out on our porch. What, it, when it, what is it going to take for us to be heard? My husband and I come home not knowing what we are going to encounter, and we're not feeling safe in our own home. At home, we choose to live a home that we cho chose to live for the rest of our lives. We should not have to come home and spend our time worrying about unsafe conditions, our quality in life in our neighborhood, and having to call local authorities when things get out of hand. Short-term renters are there to party. They're there to get loud without regard to neighbors and resident, full-time residents. They are given more rights and privileges in our neighborhoods than full-time residents. Decisions made in the past eight months by the Planning Commission and Board of Supervisors have clearly supported profit over people. As stated by one councilman at a recent public um, councilman meeting, if restrictions are made for day-night renters, then the same restrictions should be made to full-time residents. This is not correct. A full-time resident who might have a party for a 90-year-old birth, 90-year-old um, grandpa, or a teenager's high school graduation, that's only for a few hours. This does not occur day after day as what has occurred since April 15th, just of this year. Born and raised, Thank you. Next, I have Gary Verticon. Okay. 
Gary Sarvey. You're allowed to speak now, but if you're going to speak about the proposed short-term rental changes, then you won't be able to do that at the public hearing when it's scheduled. How are we going to know when it's going to be scheduled, though? That's an action item for tonight. Then I defer to speak tonight, but the more I hear and the more I see, I'm not alone in my horror stories. Next, I have Deborah Hoffbeck. Gary Vincent, I'm not sure which one you were signed up for. It was short-term rentals. Okay. Yeah, you can come ahead if it's his own. If it's not a one of the public hearings that's scheduled tonight, you, you, you're, is it on broadband? Yes. Come ahead and speak. Yes. It's fine. Just state um, your name for the record and your voting district. Greg Vincent, address 2086 Founding Way Road, Bedford, Virginia. And um, talking to the neighbors, he's got cable, she's got cable, they got cable. I don't have cable. And I was just curious if you guys could, and ladies, pardon, if you could. Um, run that little cable right down to my house and give me cable. <laughs> <laughs> I almost apologize for being up here and wasting your time, but no. my wife says, are we getting cable yet? No. Okay. So. We'll forward your name and address to the project manager so he can check on it for you. All right. <laughs> I, I, might st I might stay to watch the action tonight. <laughs> <laughs> you can take my place. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Thank Vincent. You um, Abe DeRocha, <coughs> were you signed up? I was signed up for the uh, public comment on the rezoning. Which one? Uh, the rezoning on 460 by Somerset. Okay. I'll put you in that stack. Um, I think this is Mark Kindy on Tulip Tree. Short term rental, I'll defer for the public hearing. Okay. All right. Any other citizen comments that didn't sign up that don't have anything to do with the public hearings at the moment? All right. And I'm going to close the uh, citizen comment time. That moves us down to. Our consent agenda. Mr. Hiss, if you'd like to share that with us. Yeah, well, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Chair, we had two items under the consent agenda this evening. Item A is a resolution in support of a business class <coughs> hotel in uh, Bedford County. And item B is a resolution authorizing the purchase of a vehicle for the Director of Emergency Management. Are there any questions on the consent agenda? I would like to discuss 6B. Okay. So, uh, Supervisor Vance would like to remove 6B, and we would move that to action and discussion items, which would be 9G. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman? Yes. There's no more comments. I've moved that we approve the consent agenda as amended. Okay, we have a motion from Mr. Johnson. Is there a second? Second. Second from Supervisor Parker. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Ms. Bansley? Yes. Mr. Sharp? Yes. Mr. Davis? Yes. 
Um, Mr. Scott? Yes. Ms. Parker? Yes. Chair votes yes. Motion passes. All right, there are no minutes to review and approve tonight. So that does bring us to our public hearings and presentations. Um, pretty much the same rules apply here. You'll have three minutes um, <coughs> on resolution, or, well, it's ordinance 062-623-03 and resolution R062-623-01, which is consideration of an ordinance approving rezoning application RZ22-0011 and a resolution approving special use permit SU22-0020 on behalf of Jacob A. Bur Burnop. Burnop. It's Burnop. It? Burnop. Miss Spell. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. My name is Abigail Currington. I'm with the Division of Planning, and I will be presenting the Joint Rezoning and Special Use Application RZ22-0011 and SU22-0020. The applicant for both applications is AccuPoint Surveying and Design, LLC, and the property owner is Jacob Burnop. The subject parcel is RPC number 1520660 located on US 460 <coughs> East, adjacent to 11325 East Lynchburg Salem Turnpike, Forest, Virginia 24551. The parcel size is 9.41 acres. The parcel is currently zoned as R1, and the proposed zoning is C2. The proposed use is Industry Type 1, which is the special use portion of these two applications, and it is located in Election District Number 3. The location map shows the parcel outlined in blue and its relation to other county roads. This parcel is located on US 460 East, 0.7 miles west of its intersection with Thomas Jefferson Road, New London Road, Route 811. The zoning map shows the parcel's current zoning designation as R1, with the immediate surrounding zoning including R1, R2, and PCD. The future land use map identifies the subject parcel as mostly commercial designation with a portion to the south and residential designation. The surrounding properties to the east and west have a commercial designation. The properties to the north across East Lynchburg Salem Turnpike 460 have a commercial light industrial designation and the properties to the south as residential designation. The aerial photograph from 2022 shows the parcel is undeveloped and surrounding uses include a mix of undeveloped and residential use types. This parcel is adjacent to Somerset Meadows. This is the concept plan submitted by the applicant of the subject parcel. If the rezoning and special use get approved, they will need to submit a major site plan to check compliance with the zoning ordinance as well as requirements for the reviewing agencies per their technical review committee comments. They have proposed three buildings, an enclosed welding shop, a storage building, and a retail manufacturing building. The property is served by public water and sewer. It will need a land disturbing permit. VDOT has concluded that the site will require a traffic narrative and will require the existing entrance to be upgraded to a commercial entrance at the site plan stage. The development will be visible from adjoining properties. Existing trees along the perimeter of the property will aid to reduce the visibility from the surrounding areas. The applicant has not submitted voluntary proffers. Voluntary proffers cannot be offered once the Board of Supervisors public hearing begins. The planning staff has recommended two conditions. One, general conformance with the concept plan and conformance with all ordinance standards is required for site plan approval. Any changes to the layout of the site that will result in increased impacts to adjoining properties uses shall require approval of an amended special use permit. And two, lighting at the site shall be directed downward and away from adjacent properties and roadways. <coughs> The Planning Commission public hearing was held on February 7, 2023. Several citizens spoke during the public hearing, citing concerns about increased traffic, decrease in property values, noise, 
pollutants and general incompatibility with the surrounding area. The Planning Commission voted 6-0 on two separate motions to recommend the denial of rezoning application RZ22-0011 and special use permit application SU22-0020 with staff conditions. This concludes the staff presentation. Any questions from the planning <coughs> perspective? Any questions for Abigail on the planning side? Thank you. Um, is Ms. Does the applicant wish to share anything? Um, I have where Mr. Burnup had signed up, but you get time to talk anyway. <laughs> All right, Mr. Chair, I do have a question, may I? Mm -hmm. Yes. What did you, what was the, the <coughs> VDOT uh, proposal as far as, are they talking about putting a traffic light there if, if this was approved or can you tell me? So they did not say they were gonna put a traffic light there. They just said that the existing entrance will need to be upgraded to a commercial entrance. So nothing, in other words, the, the property in question is on the south side of 460, which puts it, south of 460 eastbound, folks traveling westbound on 460, such as a tractor trailer, there's no mention of any kind of turn lane or anything such as that. Not at this point, VDOT doesn't do anything with our special uses or rezoning. Once it, if it got approved at the <coughs> site plan stage, they would review this and decide if that would be needed. But at this stage, they have not said. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bernal? <clears throat> so I'm here today to hopefully clarify what I'm trying to do here to the good people of Somerset <coughs> Meadows. Um, you may have in your mind that this thing is, you know, we're going to be smelting metal and there's going to be smoke and fumes and nothing like that. And I did go ahead and draw these other two buildings in that you see. Um, we don't know if we're even going to build those but it's a perspective maybe in the future to have a, a welding shop and, a, and an extra storage building um, the the one main building is needed um, what our plans are with this building is to do everything inside the building you know this is metal roofing that we're dealing with and I know it sounds strange because the metal roofing that we use you know will last 200 years but you don't want it to get wet when it's in a coil or when it's stacked in sheets because um, it will it will build moisture in between the layers the Sun will heat it up it will steam inside that coil and it causes defects in the paint so our plan is with our structure is to if you see the the pull through um, you know we're planning to get a one tractor trailer a week to deliver our metal we'll then open that door they'll pull into the shop we'll unload that tractor trailer with overhead cranes and then the tractor trailer pulls out and leaves. We want to manufacture this metal indoors. We want to manufacture, you know, we're just going to take flat metal and send it through roll formers and make metal roofing, uh, several different types. Um, some of it is called the ag panel, agricultural panel. You see it on all your pole barns. Um, uh, we feel like it's something that's needed in this area and you know we we manufacture standing seam now which is all a hidden fastener roof you put this roof on your house your grandkids never have to worry about it we we try to make a forever product one of the main purposes of this building is the view we want it to be a very good looking building um, we want to draw in you know some public and have a really nice storefront so when you walk into the building there's 
we plan to have a reception area where you can go up and see videos, um, samples, you know, tutorials. You can even learn how to put the roofing on yourself. So we want to make it customer friendly and having this space on 460 will be our advertisement. So this is not going to be an, an ugly place. This is not going to be something that is loud and that is smoke coming off of it of any kind. It's, um, you know, we want to draw public in. We want a good looking building. And, um, you know, do, do you have any questions for me? No, no, no. no. Oh, you're addressing the board. Oh, this is not. A, this is I not thought I was home. addressing them. <laughs> no. I was speaking to them the whole time. <laughs> no, no. We asked okay. questions. Do you have any questions? <laughs> any questions? For the board? I have a couple. First of all, what? So you have an industrial idea that you want to do. Why did you buy R1 land? Well, part of this property was zoned commercial, to my understandings. Uh, the lady that I bought the land from gave me a drawing that showed commercial buildings on it, and she said, oh, I'm sure you'll have no problem getting it zoned, you know. <laughs> and I don't know that I need the industrial zoning for this. I, you know, it, it's part of it is like a special use where I want to put that big building. Um, what, what do you expect to go there? I mean... R1 houses. It's not set up for houses. There's, there's no good house building <coughs> lots there. Um, for one, you have the great big power line that runs through the middle of it. You, you don't want houses that close to 460, and you have a little bitty section in the back, but you've got to drive through that power line to get to the, Nobody's going to buy a house there. There's other house power lines in that area that have houses near them. But um, my other question is, Oh, you were working with the economic development, I understand, to move it to the tech <coughs> park. What happened with that? Well, you know, at, at first I was confronted and, and asked to do a land swap, which, you know, I was definitely considering um, to get into the industrial park. But they, the, the fact is they're, they're not interested in, in swapping my land for that land. They want me to buy in the industrial park. I've already spent hundreds of thousands on this piece of property, and I would have to spend another half a million to get into that industrial park <coughs> and then try to sell my property. And the, the biggest part about being in the industrial park for me is I lose my advertisement on 460. I, I want that face on 460, that I want that advertisement. That, that's the whole purpose that I bought this land for. I just wish companies, we, we get, this, we get a, a lot of people who buy land on spec that they're going to rezone it. And it's a lot cheaper as a business to get, what I understand, something that's not for commercial and then rezoning it to commercial so you get into it cheaper and on spec and then come to us and expect us to rezone it. Well, that's, that was not my intention. Um, like I said, when I, when I first looked at the property to buy it, the, the owner showed me a, a plan that was already drawn up for businesses, you know, on this property and, and parking lots under the, under the power line, which is basically what I plan to do. I thought it was already, and she told me that part of it's already zoned commercial. And it is in the fact that there's a special use section, you know. I mean, I, I, I don't know where she got the information that she gave you. Right. We can't be held accountable for her misinforming I totally you. understand. That's that. not our uh, cross to bear. And from the residential standpoint, people built, bought land and built their houses there with the understanding that this was going to be R2. Right. R1. R1, excuse me. And for us to come in and, and do this, I don't, feel like we do, I don't feel like we're doing the citizens that have invested their life savings to, to move into a place that they thought was going to be R1, then now we're going to put 
commercial business there. Well, there is a separation between that right now. There's a creek that runs between my property and theirs, and we could make it more a separation. You know, we could definitely plant trees along that, that edge, um, whatever. I hate that it's a hardship on you, and you're, you're yes. in a corner right now. I, I feel for you, but I just, I just don't feel like it's my responsibility because you got a bad deal. Right. I don't want to do anything that, um, you know, makes us poor neighbors. I definitely want to have good neighbors. Are there but, any um, other questions with regard to the application from the board? Thank you. And we'll, we'll, we'll start we'll the public we'll, hearing okay. now. All right. So I have a number of people signed up to speak. You have three minutes. Pay attention to your clock. It'll be three times when your time is up. Um, you're speaking to the board as a reminder, you're not speaking to the audience. Um, debate is prohibited. So we, I might ask for a clarifica clarification on maybe something you've said. But other than that, there won't be any back and forth. Anyway, our first person up is Kenny Craig. First of all, thanks for putting me first. Well, Kenny Craig you handed it to me first. <laughs> Kenny Craig, eighteen eighty-five Colby Drive, Forest. I don't need three minutes. I'm just here to say I'm against the rezoning, and that's it. All right, thank you. Next up is Joyce Dutil. Did I say it right? Oh. <laughs> Hi, my name is Joyce Dutill, and I live at 1800 Colby Drive in Somerset Meadows. Somerset Meadows is a beautiful community. People have worked hard to build their forever homes, and they take pride in their properties. When it started in 1996, the land around it was zoned, was zoned residential to protect it from commercial and industrial projects. Why would Bedford Board of Supervisors even consider allowing rezoning for this project when there are far more suitable areas very nearby that would not infringe on the comfort of its residents in any way? It's upsetting and concerning to me to know that Mr. Burnop purchased this land before knowing whether he could even be able to use it for his project. It is zoned residential one. The future use was to turn this parcel back to commercial is my understanding. When was, it, when was it commercial? Before our community was built? Returning to commercial, was that decided before the parcel next to this one turned residential for the large community now being built? Does the board still think future use should change back to commercial with res residential all around it? Mr. Burnot not only wants this change to commercial, he wants a special use permit to use it for industrial, which is not allowed in residential, which now will be on both sides of this land. I'm not sure if the board realizes just how close this manufacturing plant and welding facility is to the homes on Colby Drive. At one point, the corner of the main building will only be 165 feet away from the corner of one of those homes. This project would produce poisonous fumes from welding I know he's saying that it's not on the, on the docket right now, but you know, it's on the plan. Noise pollution from large saws cutting metal and sanders, noise from trucks coming and going, this would be very unhealthy and disruptive to our daily lives. There are plans for retaining ponds that would spread harmful chemicals and byproducts from the welding. The creek that goes along the property line o overflows quite often, as I'm sure the retaining pools will as well. And when this happens, will pose health risks to all residents and children and further harm the environment. The traffic is already quite bad on 460. With the added traffic from the new homes being built right next to it, it will be even worse. An 18-wheeler slowly creeping out, because it is uphill, slowly creeping out of the driveway onto the highway will be even more hazardous. There was just a tractor accident there about two weeks ago. 
There was also mentioned at the last meeting that, the, that with time, the plant will expand. With the project taking up every part of the land it owns for this project, the only way to expand is more shifts and working around the clock. This manufacturing plant, nah. okay. Thank you, Ms. Dutel. Next up, I have Jose Aguirre. Good evening, Jose Aguirre, 2368 Colby Drive, District, Thri District 3. Uh, my family and I moved uh, from Northern Virginia to this wonderful community about three years ago um, with my son, uh, four-year-old son, to really seek for a, a, a better quality of life and find our forever home, and so we did in our community. We are first account witnesses of um, the impact of over -commer commercialization and, and, um, and industrialization near residential areas in Northern Virginia, so, so this is why um, Many of those impacted areas are, um, many of those that are impacted by those areas are moving, you know, even to, towards this area because we wanted to get away from, from, from that type of uh, lifestyle and living. So we understand that each situation and locality may have unique considerations. Uh, hence, community dialogues such as this meeting here today are important in, uh, to allow both sides to address concerns and, and to ensure the best outcome for everyone involved. Um, however, we respectfully oppose the rezoning um, and the special use permit uh, for the purpose of establishment of the construction of this industrial uh, type of metal building adjacent to our, to our homes that we um, have spent so much um, sacrifice to, to be able to, to achieve. And so um, this doesn't really also take into account um, the residential construction that is going nearby too. Um, and so we're here to present our concerns. I don't wanna go through a list of safety concerns. I think some of those have been addressed, but um, we uh, are here again to present those concerns uh, that affect our establishment of community and in consideration to the impact of this operation we'll bring in terms of those areas. Um, my, um, there are some concerns for our children, for our elderly, um, and those, in my personal case, uh, those that have been affected by uh, autoimmune compromise um, uh, diseases. My, my wife is, is on the liver transplant list, and we, have, we wanted to get away from that because we don't wanna be near those types of risks that may affect or may not affect our community. We just don't know, but uh, the risk is there. Apart from us being able to uh, quickly access 460 to head on out to uh, towards UVA where we receive treatment is important for us um, and in, in essence again I don't want to go through the list of different issues that we already know like uh, decrease in property values there's all these other factors and influences that may be uh, at stake but uh, it is critical that um, these types of uh, operations operate away from residential areas such as ours such as ours to appropriately operate and adhere to safety protocols as well that are that need to be in place um, in those standards. Now, the construction of this plan will cause a major impact by uh, affecting what's already been mentioned here as far as environment and other areas, but we thank you for your time. Thank Appreciate you, Mr. Aguirre. Next up, I have, can't be both, but it can be either Sienna or Shane Gunn. I'm Shauna Gunn. Um, we live at 1695 Colby Drive. My husband, Shane Gunn, who's general manager of Berkeley and Toyota, also in Bedford County. Um, obviously, we're all here for the same reason tonight. Um, as we understand, there's over 200 homes being built um, on New London Road, and there's hundreds more proposed on 460 across from Owens Market. I believe those uh, homes were probably not factored into the traffic impact analysis. You guys could probably clarify that a little bit better. Although our backyard overlooks 460, we fell in love with the view of the farmland behind us. And in the summertime, the tree line gives us a little bit of privacy, but not much. Speaking of the tree line that we can all see today, it isn't there in the fall and winter. The proposed metal shop will essentially be directly in our backyard and in the backyard of the Dutels, whose property borders ours. Ironically enough, the GIS map shown above do not have all the homes factored into that that have been built since 2022. Ours is on there. I don't know if that was a coincidence or not. Um, it's worth mentioning we did purchase our home for $890,000 last year, and I can't imagine the resale effects on an $890,000 home with a metal shop in the backyard. Besides obviously damaging the property values of the home in Somerset Meadows, 
the air and noise pollution would make it almost insufferable for us to maintain our right to a quiet enjoyment. After working long hours at our jobs that pay Bedford County taxes, we feel we have a right to enjoy our home. We know our children should be subject to inhaling the manganese, lead, and hexavalent chromium fumes that would be emitted from the proposed plant. We're always happy to see another business come to Bedford County. Um, however, this one belongs in an industrial park or on a larger parcel that does not back up to a residential neighborhood, especially one that's growing and has tons of families. Um, but our trust is in the Board of Supervisors tonight to make the right decision and to protect the homeowners of Somerset Meadows. Our health, our children's health, and our property values are all relying on you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gunn. Next, I have Robert Stanley. Good evening. Uh, my name is Robert Stanley. I live at 2410 Colby. I oppose the uh, zoning application from Burnout Metal. I worked in a sheet metal business fabrication shop for 38 years, and I can tell you it's not a pretty sight. Uh, I, I, I just don't want to live in this type of environment. Number one is the noise. That's, it's, it's a lot of noise considered uh, from the sheet metal. From, it, from a time a sheet metal is delivered, it's usually tracked and trailer, even if it's one, even if it's just one load a week. Uh, it's still, it's got to be offloaded either with fork trucks or overhead cranes, which are all very noisy. Uh, usually it's, uh, it can be skids of sheet metal or it can be coils, rolls of steel. Uh, and again, handling all of this is very noisy. Uh, the metal has to either be sheared, uh, it's sheared uh, on uh, Machines are sheared off, or I think uh, Mr. Bernhoff said he was uh, roll forming. This is a machine where they put coil steel on. It goes through a conveyor and so forth. It'll shear it to different sizes, uh, break the sides up into a panel, like a, uh, like a C-shaped panel. And again, all of this creates all kinds of noise. Uh, these panels might be six inches wide, could be up to 36 inches wide, could be up to 24 feet long. And when you're handling this kind of stuff, it's, as you can think, it would be very noisy. Um, please excuse me. And it's not, especially, you know, when you talk about, you don't know what kind of shifts this is gonna be done on. They're starting work at seven o'clock in the morning. Uh, you want to wake your children to wake up in the summertime with the fork truck in your backyard, unloading a truck of steel or a roll, uh, roll forming machine running. Uh, it's very noisy. Uh, and again, we don't know what's going to be there in the future. You know, a welding shop, uh, so forth. Uh, and I can't believe it's not mentioned somewhere along the line that it's not going to be some type of paint facility that needed. I mean, when you're working with steel, uh, it, it's after you've cheered, cut it, whatever, uh, it's got to be coated with something to keep from rusting or oxidizing. Uh, so somewhere along the line, that could come into play. Uh, and again, with the traffic, I think that's a big point too, with the traffic coming in out of 460, uh, it's already at between uh, 811 New London Road and Owens Market. It's just countless accidents. It's just a, almost a daily occurrence. Thank you, Mr. Stanley. We don't Stanley. need that. Thank you. Appreciate it. Next up, I have John Detail. Hello, um, I'm John Dutil, uh, 1669 Colby Drive. Um, my property is the one that is, well, one of the ones that is directly bordering the proposed metal shop. Um, and we, we bought our house in Somerset Meadows a little over two years ago. Spent a very large amount on the property after saving for many years uh, because we you know, really like this neighborhood and the fact that it's not near something like this. Um, the metal metalworking manufacturing plant would be detrimental to my family in many ways that I know. 
I'm sure there's also many that we don't yet realize, you know, um, as he was just mentioning the painting and other things going on. There's so much potential for more um, than even is being proposed here. Um, I have three kids. Um, they play outside every day. Uh, I used the tool on the county website earlier. And, um, you know, using this map up here, I was able to figure out that the corner of that building, um, I can show you on the map here. This is from your website, from the, Bed the Bedford County website. The, uh, that's my house here. Well, they have a 35-foot buffer zone that's on their, propose their proposal here. I went 35 feet over the line, and that's only 51 meters from the corner of my house. Um, not my property line, my house. Uh, my kids play back here in the backyard. Uh, we actually have a pool that um, we were going to be putting in um, out there, so obviously closer, you know, half of a football field away, um, our outside, you know, area for relaxation, our expensive project that we're doing is going to be uh, about half of a football field away from a metalworking plant. And um, this is just really not what we were looking for when we moved to Virginia. Um, and um, there's obviously many other places <coughs> that are more appropriate uh, for this type of project. And um, I mean, we really just cannot have this in our backyard. Um, so that's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dale. Next up, I'm sorry, I don't know if you're Mr. or Mrs., but it, Woodward is the last name. I got one initial. <laughs> it's Mr. Woodward. Thank you. <laughs> a, a quick question first if I may uh, regarding two speakers from the same address is that okay that's or, fine okay um, I want to change mine some to avoid repetition of what the uh, board has already heard um, and try to just offer a little bit different perspective um, these notes summarize evidence for um, requesting that the proposal be denied. First, the proposal itself admits that the business is out of place. It belongs in a commercial industrial district where noise, toxic chemicals, constant traffic, etc., can function uh, in the vicinity of other businesses not close to homes and families. The company is an outsider, not trying to fit in, but trying to force its way upon us because it knows that it does not and cannot fit in a residential community. Second, as an outsider, it sees New London Forest as a business platform for product and profit. The pop of welding machinery, the noise of 18 wheelers and other large commercial trucks. There's nothing wrong with welding, with business, and with profit, unless they distort and undermine the families and individuals of New London. I refer here to quality of life, but we'll forego yet another summary <laughs> because everybody knows uh, what quality of life has to do with. What concerns me, board members, is the evidence for the proposal. Uh, where is that evidence to support it? Is that evidence in public view somewhere? Um, otherwise, I don't know how the proposal has any support. Um, maybe this is why the Planning Commission met and reached its, its decision uh, recently about this matter. At that meeting, there were questions and a representative of the company stated that the owner was not present and could not answer questions. To me, that spoke volumes about priorities regarding the whole idea. The business, as we've heard, does have reasonable options. 
keep its current site or find another location already zoned commercial industrial. So the company's idea of using New London Strike One. The Mr. Woodard. There are two other strikes that I didn't get to. <laughs> Thank you. Next up I have Hugh Bug. Bugs? Bug. B U G G. Yes. Uh, my name's Hugh Bug. I live at fourteen sixty three Cobra Drive and this building will be kind of near my home. Um it's, it's, it's weird to me because I've had land rezone before in the manufacturing and stuff. This is heavy manufacturing going against R1. I mean, that, that, that just doesn't happen. I mean, I don't even know. I feel sorry for him for doing this, but he should have got a contingency on this being rezoned before you buy it. I mean, that's where you buy commercial property. Um, but, yeah, I'm against it, and, you know, it's heavy manufacturing. That's what it is. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bowe. Next up, I have Kurt Michael. My name is Kurt Michael, 1024 Remington Road in uh, Somerset Meadows. I just want to express that I appreciate all you all do and in looking into this matter. I agree that this is not a good fit for the community. I live on the other side of the community and just looking, I think that as citizens we see that this isn't a good fit. As your planning commission looked at it, they said it was not a good fit and I think at this point it's just not a good fit and um, I just ask you to deny this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Michael. Next up is Jennifer Lampley. I'm Jennifer Lampley from 1441 Colby in Somerset. Um, I've come here tonight to speak out against changing the zone from residential to industry. Um, I have a family of nine that lives in a home um, that we chose because it was a nice area with a clean environment. Um, my house of nine includes myself, my husband, two elderly, five kids, um, myself and one of the children who have asthma. And as someone themselves has a child with asthma, air pollution is a major concern. And with metalworking, it's not without dust, smoke, fumes, and chemicals, and this is coming from the daughter of a welder. <laughs> um, these things do get into the air, and they do cause air pollution. This air pollution is a direct threat to my family and our neighbors. Even the CDC's website lists things that are concerns for individuals who live near or work in these kind of facilities. Environmental Justice Lab research has shown that this industry releases <coughs> metals into our soil. This is risking exposing us to contaminants such as lead, arsenic, cadmium, etc. Scientific American has published studies that show how communities near industries face higher health risks due to air quality and issues. Not to mention the National Institute of Health has stated that both industrial and non-industrial exposures to metals are responsible for a variety of chronic ailments, which I am also a person who deals with chronic illnesses. I don't need more. <laughs> This list goes on for research and information published on our government and health sites alike. States such as Texas, Illinois, and Pennsylvania have lawsuits regarding these kind of pollutant issues. And we should not have to be afraid to breathe the air around our homes or plant our own gardens. There's even an industrial park not far from this location that is meant for places like this. Not to mention their intentional use of outdated photos to misrepresent the proximity to our homes. A place like this has no place next to our homes, and I, for one, have never per would have never purchased a home if I had known that we would be right by such a place. I love my home, and it would be sad to have to leave it because of something like this coming in and not <coughs> respecting the residents that already live in the community that they are trying to come into. Commerce or not, these are our homes and our lives that already exist in this community, and we ask that you please hear our concerns and take them to heart. Um, we did, <laughs> last minute, did a poll um, we had 46 votes um, on it that were voting to no to this. Um, there was none for it, and there were at least seven different comments that were put on here, and most of them are citing a lot of the same things that you're hearing from everybody here today. And I know I couldn't get up here and speak to all theirs, but I wanted to make their voices seen too. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Lankley. Next up is Debbie Woodard. Woodard. And I bet you he gave you items two and three. 
<laughs> Maybe I have item one. Yes, I am Debbie Woodard, 2425 Colby Drive. As a Somerset resident and former Bedford County school teacher, I would ask you to base your decision today on our children, on our future. They've already spoke to a lot of other things. I'm speaking for the children. While teaching up the road at Bedford Elementary, we could hear the noise from commercial trucks going by. And outside or at recess, we could smell the diesel fumes from a lot of those trucks. And I have a reason my voice is so scratchy. I'll tell you why. Um, farther, closer to the road, though, is New London Academy. You know how close it sits to 460. We're talking about noise, air pollution, water pollution already mentioned. But what about the children? What about the children in your jurisdiction, in our jurisdiction, who are going to be affected by this pollution at school? New London also has many soccer fields where the children play team sports. And do these children need quality air to breathe? Of course they do. These chemicals, as noted before, and the pollution will affect these young children's bodies, as we know. Their bodies are underdeveloped, they're forming, and they don't need to form with all these chemicals. The trucks bring in the supplies, one a week was mentioned, really? Um, really? Will these traffic problems be um, adjusted later? These trucks need to make turns. That hasn't been uh, referenced by VDOT, and I'm gonna have to go fast, but uh, a couple of weeks ago, as mentioned, there was already a wreck. I sat there for 10 or 15 minutes before I took a shortcut. A friend said she stayed, stayed there 45 minutes waiting on the wreck to be dissolved right before New London Academy. What's going to happen with more trucks, more congestion right there? It's going to be a madhouse. Um, you haven't probably addressed the forest fire station closing in the industrial park. We have already been affected. Some other Somerset residents have been affected. Our insurance is going up. We found out last week it's gonna go up $500 next year because of not being close to a fire station. The 811 fire station was mentioned with the new houses. Our um, insurance says that's not close enough. They don't accept that. All these new homes, all this industry, it's gonna be far away from the fire station. That's gonna affect all of us. But as a former teacher, this is asthma. I didn't develop it until I was an adult, about in fact, about 15 years ago. I was pollution free growing up. I lived out in um, a suburb. And I don't want a child growing up and having to develop breathing problems as I have the last 15 years. So please, think of our children and think of their um, growth in our residential area, and especially when they go to school. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Woodard. Next up is Elizabeth Armstrong. <clears throat> Good evening. I'm Beth Armstrong. I live at um, 1282 Carlton Place. And um, I don't really know what I can say that anyone else hasn't already said. We've heard from lots of experts here that have worked in that type of business, people that have had things rezoned. And it just seems like it's a bad idea to rezone this property from um, R1 to commercial. I feel like you guys all know that. But I just want to come up here and voice my opinion. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Armstrong. Next, I have Jenna Gregory. Hi, Jenna Gregory, 1630 Somerset. Um, again, I uh, can't say much more than what's been said, but I appreciate your time. I uh, respectfully and strongly decline this. I hope that you guys will all see that as well. I think you said it best, sir, when you said, um, unfortunately, this business decision isn't your cross to bear. It seemed like a decision made on some misinformation, some high hopes, um, but unfortunately, there just seems to be on the pros and cons list so many more cons, and all the pros just really go for the business and, and nobody <coughs> else. So um, thank you for your time. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you, Ms. Gregory. Let's see. Next, I have William Barrett. bad thing about being toward the end is that everybody's already hit it. <laughs> so I'll just say this. Seven days after moving in my house, which is not shown on that aerial, 
rendering, I found out that the nice meadow behind my house could potentially be rezoned for commercial use. Like Mr. Burnop, had I known that, I would have had to think long and hard about whether I would want to live there. Um, I would respectfully ask that the entirety of the board reject this proposal and leave that lot as a residential building site. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, I have Vicki Dell. Hello, Vicki Dell, 1629 Somerset Drive. Um, everybody's pretty much, I'm opposed to this um, proposal. Um, simply because I feel like um, when the original proposal was made, it was disingenuous because it did not show the actual buildings placed on the property. Um, it, when we went before the um, Planning Commission, I voiced that concern as well. Um, everybody here has already said what needs to be said, the heavy metals. Um, traffic is a concern, um, noise, quality of life. Um, I think we're in a position where I respectfully ask the, um, the Board of Supervisors to do what's right um, because it affects so many people in here um, because this property, the property surrounding this, um, this proposal is worth several million dollars and we do pay our taxes hopefully and um, you know it would impact us a great deal to have our property values decline I've lived in Somerset Meadows for 20 years and I've never had to question what's going to happen in that piece of property because it was zoned R1 and I know in the future um, there is um, a plan to potential I think comprehensive plan indicates that it might turn into a commercial property in the future but the this is a light industrial property that he's asking this to be rezoned to um, and it's just not right that's all I got thank you Ms. Dale next up I have James Watson Mr. Watson Move on to Jill Distel. Hi, good evening, Jill Distad, um, 1729 Colby Drive. Um, I've lived in Somerset coming up on three years. Um, my property is the house that looks like it's almost built. Um, so obviously, as everyone else said, a lot of other houses around us, when we purchased the property, obviously we knew we were buying it on 460. It's loud sometimes. Certainly did not think that there could potentially add a machine shop behind our house. Um, you know, my husband and I both work from home. We like to go sit out on our back porch sometimes and work. Certainly don't want to hear Tra trailers, uh, you know, all that kind of thing. Obviously, the traffic as well. Heard multiple accidents behind our house. Look out and see all sorts of um, issues back there. So, obviously, this would only make that worse. Um, we have two small children as well, so concerned about anything that can come from that. Um, so, again, um, as all of our other neighbors have said, and uh, my neighbors at 1737 as well, um, who couldn't be here, so we obviously oppose. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You've been so patient. Last one, David DeRosha. Uh, David DeRosha, 1081 Carewood Drive. And uh, I'm a business owner. I've been looking for a piece of land on 460. And the problem is everything's so expensive, especially if it's zoned commercial. So I really feel for Mr. Burnup. But I did want to point out I've got about 5.4 million reasons why we should um, not allow this to go here. Uh, 1729 Colby. Tax assessed value, 672. 
Uh, these are only the properties that border the property. 1737, tax assessed value 626. 1695 Colby, tax assessed value 884, 200. 1669 Colby, tax assessed value 741, 200. 1643 Colby Drives, tax assessed value 789, 600. 1599, 610,000. And then the property right next to it is 1.7 million. Those are all the bordering properties of this. Mr. Burnup's property is valued at 140. He paid 160. That's less than uh, what $18,000 per acre for land that's on 460. So we got an incredible value on that property because it was zoned residential and you know all the challenges of it. So based on just fairness and you know public trust in the government, you know these zoning laws are put into, into place to protect situations just like this. Everybody bought there and built these million dollar houses there knowing that that was residential and you couldn't build this there and so it's basically wrong to rezone it at that point um, another thing you know as i am pro-business um, this piece of property there just there's no mitigation factors that you can have for this if you look at all those topographical lines i believe they're 10 feet apart so every one of those houses that's bordering that is going to be just looking down at the roof of this building and just everything that's back behind it, the dumpsters, the trash, whatever's behind the building. So I know Mr. Burnham will have a nice sign up on the front and a nice storefront. No one's going to see that from the back. All the people that it's going to affect, they're going to be just looking down. So there's no fence he could build. There's no buffer he could build that would mitigate any of that in this situation. And the noise, noise travels up and out. So it's like even if you had all your fence lines, your tree lines, your tree buffers, none of that's going to affect the noise because you're 100 feet higher than that house right there. And it's just a terrible piece of property for this. I mean, look how everything's just wedged up in there. If you look at it, it's all sloped up in there. It's definitely trying to put something in there that's not supposed to go there. And so that's why all these people are here to let you know, hey, look, we don't want, I'm supposed to build a pool for one of these guys you know, 50, 75 feet from overlooking that building. And if you see the building, it's basically, in order to fit it in there, it's touching the corner of the property. And so while I would like to see Mr. Burnup get his project approved someplace else in Bedford County. Thank you. Okay, that was the last person I had signed up on that. So I'm gonna close the uh, public comment, or public hearing portion of this. And if the applicant has a rebuttal, he can come forward. do just have two things. Um, I totally understand what everybody is saying. Like I said, I would not want to be a bad neighbor. Um, one thing, nobody's property that has spoke here tonight or anything in Somerset Meadows on this side touches 460. This property borders 460. Um, there needs to be some kind of business there. It, you know, if you don't approve this, um, there needs to be some kind of business there. Um, it's just not laid out for residential. That, that spot right there is not. Um, I don't see residential houses working. So the other question is, I was just wondering if it's common for a person on the board to reach out to people to vote against things that they don't want. Is that common practice? I'm gonna have to ask you to clarify. Reach out to who? Well, Miss. Bansley here has been sending messages through Facebook to the good people at Somerset Meadows. Um, I, um, Mr. Chairman, I have not sent any Facebook message. I, people have emailed me and I've responded. Now, if they put that on there, I'm not on their Facebook page, so if they put that on their Facebook page, I 
face. I just didn't know that was a common thing that was done. This isn't her, this is Mr. Steele. This is Jerry Steele. Read down the bottom, you see who it came from. But he, that sounds like he's copied something. He's copied something I've told him. That's not her posting it. received the following this morning. Um, Jerry Steele is saying on that Facebook page. And so that doesn't sound like she posted it. I, I'm not even on that. What, I'm not on, I, don't, I don't live in the neighborhood. I'm not on their neighborhood Facebook page. How is he on the neighborhood Facebook page? Okay. I have friends in your neighborhood that have told me okay. this. All right, I'm going to call it to order. We don't, this is not what we do. You know. Um, you know, I, I guess I have nothing else to say other than the property is really not working for residential housing. Something's going to be built there. There is a section that is zoned for um, commercial use, at least uh, special use, I understand. Um, some kind of business needs to go there. It will bring jobs to the community. It can be an asset to all of these people. Right. Thank you, sir. All right. So I'll open it up to the board now for discussion and any possible action. Anything from the board? Mr. I don't expect much discussion on this. I think uh, I feel for him that he bought it. I think he was misled. And I'm just not going to punish him. I'm not willing to punish him citizens are already there who, who built their place um, under the understanding that this is where they're going to be living. I, I, I just, I don't support this and I do support a motion to deny. We have a motion from Mr. Johnson to deny. Uh, he said he would support a motion. Would support a motion. Yeah, because there may be more comments. All I'd right. I'd like say that you all know and most people know that I am pro-business, I'm pro-jobs. And I uh, wish Mr. Bernhoff all the best in finding a suitable location. I disagree with the neighbors that this um, industrial use is out of place in this neighborhood. And if there's no more discussion, I would um, like to move that we reject this special use plan. And I'll second. Okay, we have to reject the rezoning. The first rezoning. Oh, yeah, reject the rezoning. And I'll second. So we have a motion by. Uh, Ms. Bansley, seconded by Mr. Sharp, to deny rezoning application RZ22-0011. It's a roll call vote. Yep, Mr. Johnson. Yes. Ms. Bansley. Yes. Mr. Sharp. Yes. Mr. Davis. Yes. Mr. Scott. Yes. Ms. Parker. Yes. Chair votes yes. We need to clean the other one up too. The special there's no reason is moot. Okay. okay. All right. If there's no okay. reason, there's no. Oh, I would just like to make one comment. Mrs. Gunn, I don't know where you're from, but you speak as fast as my daughter listens to <laughs> YouTube on like triple speed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. I'm like, she cannot be from around here. <laughs> Chairman, the guy, that, the guy that's on TV that gets paid all those big bucks to do those disclaimers at the end of the automotive ads. Yeah, there you go. He passed away recently, and there's an opening that I encourage you to check into. I will tell you, I was like, well, okay, I really got to pay attention. So, and I, 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 that just isn't something I'm accustomed to. All right, we're going to move along in our uh, agenda. The next uh, public hearing is up for Ordinance approving rezoning application RZ23-0002. We'll take about a two-minute break for those that don't wish to sit through another one. Mr. Chair, I think if we had to sit through what we did, they should have sit through. <laughs> I think I'm going to take a two-minute break. You're going to take a break. I'm going to bath. Clock's running. Huh? Clock's running. <laughs> Patrick.
get her to do your uh, closed session. <laughs> Did you make note of it also? <laughs> oh, yeah. I was like, wow. That guy, that guy passed away about, I'm going to say, eight months ago. The guy that does all those disclaimers, he passed away. And, yeah. No, it's seriously, because my daughter listens to YouTube, like on double speed or something like that. And I'm like, how do you understand it? But she just, and she, so now my daughter oh, speaks she, it. She speaks really fast. And I'm like, but I, I, I tell her, like, Lauren, no one's going to believe you're from around here because you talk so fast. But it's because she listens to YouTube on double speed. Now we've lost her. We're going to get back on track here with uh, rezoning application RZ23-0002 on behalf of Viridian Properties, LLC, which is Ordinance 062623-01. Abigail. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. My name is Abigail Currington. I'm with the Division of Planning, and I will be presenting the rezoning application RZ23-0002. The applicant is Will Yeager, and the property owner is Viridian Properties, LLC. The subject parcels are RPC number 21007000 and 21007100, with their entrance located off Piney Grove School Road, 0.13 miles from its intersection with Manita Road. The parcels are 0.546 acres and 2.68 acres, and they are asking to rezone 1.186 acres. The parcels are currently zoned as AP and C2, with the proposed zoning being C2. The proposed use is a mini warehouse use, and they are located in election district number two. Please note that the properties went through a subdivision plat that was approved and recorded on May 9th to create the entrance to the lot from Piney Grove School Road. Because of how recent the subdivision was, our maps do not reflect the changes to the parcels. This is the concept plan submitted by the applicant. If the rezoning gets approved, they will need to submit a major site plan for the establishment of the mini warehouse use, which is a by right use with additional standards in Article 4 in the C2 district and to check compliance with the zoning ordinance as well as requirements for the reviewing agencies per their technical review committee comments. The location map shows the parcel outlined in blue and its relation to other county roads. The parcel's entrance is located on Piney Grove School Road, Route 648. The zoning map shows the parcel's current zoning designation as split zoned with C2 and AP. The immediate surrounding zoning also includes C2 and AP. The future land use map identifies the subject parcels as both commercial and agricultural natural resource stewardship. The surrounding properties to the north, east, and west are identified as agricultural natural resource stewardship and properties to the south as commercial designation. The aerial photograph from 2022 shows the parcels are currently undeveloped. 
The property will be served by private utilities. VDOT will require a traffic narrative at the site plan stage. A land disturbing permit will be needed if 10,000 feet or 10,000 square feet or greater is disturbed and or within 200 feet of a body of water. The applicant has not submitted voluntary proffers with this application. Voluntary proffers cannot be offered once the Board of Supervisors public hearing begins. The Planning Commission public hearing was held on June 6, 2023. One citizen spoke during the public hearing, citing concerns of increased traffic, decrease in property values, and unesthetic visibility concerns. The Planning Commission voted 7-0 to zero to recommend approval of the application. And this concludes the staff presentation. Any questions from the planning perspective? Any questions for Abigail? Okay. Um, does the applicant, I think, will? Good evening. Um, thank you all for allowing us to come speak. I'm, I'm here on behalf of uh, Steve and Celeste Bailey, owners of Iridian Properties, and we're here to just respectfully request a contiguous zoning for these uh, parcels so that we can move forward with a uh, uh, mini warehouse site. Um, as noted with Abigail's report, the aerial view shows undeveloped property with Manita Farm Supply right behind it. Um, during the planning commission, there was a uh, neighbor that came and said that uh, they were concerned about the um, unsightliness of the site behind it, but we are proposing a landscape buffer yard between that and the residential property to help mitigate those circumstances. And the proposed concept plan. Um, is there any questions of a technical nature for these? Can you back up to the previous, so the tree line has been removed, correct? Uh, correct, yes, so the, the property has been logged, but we are planning on coming back with uh, evergreens along the uh, residential portion. So the, this landscaping buffer that you're talking about, is that gonna be, be to, between this property and 1128 and 1080 or whatever? Yes, yes, sorry, the two, I can't tell. yes, the two houses uh, that, are, that are currently in place. It shows up on the plan right there, but I need to press a small, small script. You can't see it. Okay. And we are proposing to rezone the small wedge parcel in the back just for stormwater management. Current zoning requires that all the parcels that use commercial must be zoned appropriately. So that's why we're having, we had to do the access road as well. So actually, it's the retention ponds and so forth that are on the piece that you're asking to be rezoned? Correct. And the, uh, the small strip of roadway, all that is now one parcel except for the one in the rear. That okay. has been remained uh, as, it, okay. as it is. So the buildings themselves are all going to be on what's currently C2? Correct. Can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. the, the road where you're, it's coming off of Piney Grove School Road, mm -hmm. I've got GIS pulled up. Can you switch back one? Well, so where is the road coming in off of? It'll, be, it'll be in that curve uh, area. Um, the cleared, the cleared out? Yes, yes, between the So it comes in and goes, okay. Yes. The, this subdivision plat that we did um, was that open field area. We created two residential lots and an access strip okay. to come through. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see. I have one person that has signed up for the public hearing comment portion. So we'll open that now. And uh, Ken Newman. Ken Newman with uh, Royal Oak Farm. I happen to be the person that owns 1088 Pioneer Ridge. And uh, <coughs> I've got, 
some pictures and stuff of what it uh, was like before when I brought the property. Um, you like to pass them along? Sure. <coughs> I have no objection. My property is C2 as well. I just want a buffer zone of five to six foot pines across the back because uh, when we brought the place it was fully wooded and they cut exactly down the property line causing some trees and everything on the property line to blow down in a uh, windstorm a couple of days after they logged it. So I say being my property is C2, I've got no objections to what they're going to do um, because they're going to use uh, open storage for boats and RVs. I like that buffer zone because that house is remaining residential until someone comes along and wants to buy it for the right price. <coughs> so that's basically it. Okay. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Thank you. Didn't have anyone else signed up for that. So if there is no one else, I'm going to close the public comment time for that. And there you go. Anything else you'd like to address? Can, and can you confirm what type of landscape buffering you're talking about? Uh, right now we are showing a type B 25 foot buffer yard and we will comply with uh, whatever zoning requirements are. We're considering uh, security fencing, but also yes, evergreen trees to keep that section of it very uh, shadowed. So. Okay. Well, is type B more than what he's asking for? I believe so. Okay. All right, I think that's it. Okay. Um, any other discussion from the board? I guess I'm just questioning the buffer that uh, Ken's talking about. It can't be a proffer because you can't do a proffer after the after we, we opened it up. But is this special use? It's not a special use, it's a rezone, so it's a rezone. It's a rezone. no conditions and there are no proffers. I just want to make sure that that, that you know, is that going to be in writing? Is it going to be allowed to have that stipulation on it? No, sir. I didn't think so. No, you can't condition that. <laughs> so where are we? You're going to have to take him at his word. If okay, that's what I was It's, as part of the site plan process, it's a requirement that he, he would have to have that buffer yard. It doesn't have to be a part of the rezoning. There'll be a requirement for the site plan process. I'm so glad you're on here. <laughs> Thank you. I got a little help. Thank you. <laughs> Any other discussion? If not, I would um, entertain a motion. Mr. Chair, if, um, I would go to make a motion to approve um, ordinance. Zero O zero six two six two three dash zero one. Second. We have, we have a motion by Ms. Parker, seconded by Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Ms. Bansley. Yes. Mr. Sharp. Yes. Mr. Davis. Yes. Mr. Scott. Yes. Ms. Parker. Yes. Chair votes yes. Motion passes. That moves us on to our next public hearing. Consideration of an ordinance amending Chapter 4, Animals, Section 4-50, Intentional Interference with a Guide or Leader Dog, Penalty, Ordinance 0626236234. Mr. Skelly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in the last General Assembly session, um, HB 1450 removed all references in Virginia Code to the word handicapped and substituted in the word disabled. Um, a lot of our enabling legislation was changed as a result of that, but we only have two ordinances that were really affected. It's this one and then some in the tax ordinance that's coming up next. So what's before you right now is just simply to strike the word handicapped from this particular ordinance which prohibits interference with a god dog. To, and that makes it uh, in conformity with the new verbiage of state code. This just Text Technical cleanup. amendment. Any other questions from the board? This is a public hearing. No one has signed up, but I will open it up to anyone that would like to talk about dogs. I like dogs. <laughs> <laughs> All right, no one's jumping. So we'll close the public hearing portion. 
And uh, any other clarifications from the board? <coughs> Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion to approve ordinance 0062623-04. I have a motion for Mr. Sharp. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Parker. This is a roll call. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Ms. Bansley. Yes. Mr. Sharp. Yes. Mr. Davis. Yes. Mr. Scott. Yes. Ms. Parker. Yes. Chair votes yes. Motion passes. That brings us to our final public hearing, which is consideration of an ordinance amending Chapter 17, Taxation, Section 17-22, Exemption of Farm Machinery and Farm Implements, Section 17-54, Notice in Section 17-134, Exemptions, Limits on Application, Ordinance 0062-623-05. Mr. Skelly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And we have uh, two things at play in this ordinance revision, proposed ordinance revision. One, it's the same technical amendment. We do have a uh, exemption for disabled persons. Um, so we're striking the word handicapped from our ordinance in that regard. Um, there is also now permitted an exemption for farm use vehicles uh, and farm use trailers. Um, so the uh, amendment that's before you is to provide for that exemption in our tax code. Any questions from Mr. Skelly? I do have a question. I see a lot of vehicles on the highway that have farm yeah, use on them. and. Some of them, yeah, I don't understand how they can be applicable for a farm. I mean, I can understand it. Uh, a very wealthy man that I knew had a uh, 3500 Chevrolet pickup with a diesel engine that he used on his farm, and he, he had a farm use tag on it. Makes sense, right? But then you'll see folks driving around with little pickups, and, and I don't mean to disparage him, but little pickup trucks that you, know, you could hardly haul some firewood in with farm use, is there any distinction actually made? The DMV starting July 1st is requiring an actual farm use tag. None of the little placards you get at Southern States or Tractor Supply would suffice. Um, the Commissioner of Revenue and I have kind of discussed what the criteria would be, but there has to be some legitimate proof that it's used in a farming business because someone. The Ag Board's discussed this in a lot of detail. It's, it's been there a lot and they're talking to folks in Richmond about I missed it. that meeting <laughs> well number one this doesn't have anything to do with what, what he's talking about that's he's talking about the vehicles we're talking about the exemption on the on the vehicles on the yeah. implements and the no well, it would be but now you can exempt a vehicle as well and that's kind of um the, but they, they they've gone down the road a pretty long ways with Richmond yes sir on the legislation so does the current tax code before the change would be made levy taxes on hay balers and you know forage harvesters? No, implements had had already been exempt. Okay. We're talking more about roadworthy vehicles and trailers for the most part that are now can be exempted. Okay. Basically, titled vehicles. Titled vehicles. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Tuck. I mean, if you have a 1940 International out there, I'm not going to worry too much about that one. <laughs> Any other discussion? This is also a public hearing, and I don't have anyone signed up, but I'll open the public hearing if you want to talk about tractors and trucks and hay balers. Yes, ma'am. Yes, please. Please state your name. <laughs> To, sorry, actually bring in like your, a Schedule C farm, your farming um, schedule to prove that your vehicle is being <coughs> used for farm use. So that's basically kind of how we're going to operate it in our office. You're going to have to prove to, and that will help keep the v people that aren't using farm Just vehicles. And a question, Tracy, if I may, what's the criteria for farm use like on a trailer? Again, it's they're going to go to the DMV, okay. and we'll use um, that. Would be our guide if the DMV allows it, and and also they'll have to bring in their farm schedule, and their farm schedule should list that trailer. 
So it's not going to be every single vehicle or trailer that rides the streets now with the farm use tag. And They've got to prove. There's a lot of them on the streets now that don't have insurance. Is what, is what we've been talking about. And that they're going to tighten that up. They're, they're trying to get away with the $500 a year fee that you uninsured motorists. Yeah. But all of that's nothing to do with us. That's all state. I just want the farmers to get the exemption, the true farmers. Yeah. They, they need a crack on them. Antique tags also. I mean, because I just because it's an old vehicle. I mean, I see people. They're not going to an an antique car show. Right. Right. They're but driving it to and from work. You need to do something about all the antiques driving them. <laughs> so, me talking about me. Yeah, no. You just put <laughs> antique tags and then stop paying taxes and stuff. Yeah. That's the code. Right. I can't. Anything to do with the yeah, well, the, I mean, the, have to follow the yeah. DMV the, says you can only use it for certain purposes, yeah. but nobody's enforcing it. It's a real tough one to enforce because you, <clears throat> the code provides you can use it for occasional pleasure driving. Now, if you're using it to commute back and forth to work, that obviously doesn't count. But if you pull someone over and they just say, "Well, it's just running out for," yeah, yeah. yeah. So. But yeah, there are a lot of things Thank out you. there that are tagged as antiques that. Are not collector's items. Yeah. All right. I'm going to close the citizen comment. Yes. You just write under it. I'm just looking for clarification. I'm Megan Johnson, District 7. Um, Lucy Patterson is Commissioner of Revenue. Tracy. Oh, Tracy. That's right. Uh, that's Lucy, if you didn't agree. <laughs> <laughs> It, it sounds like you're going to be able to find the answers if you go to DMV. They're the ones that are going to be making that decision, not Tracy Patterson okay. and not the county. That's, that's great, but DMV is a huge, very confusing website. So if somebody could send me a link, that would be great. Well, in the meantime, just run to Southern States or your nearest farm store and Good buy your July farm, first. farm tag. <laughs> In the meantime, just run to your nearest farm store and buy you a farm use tag before they take them off the shelf. <laughs> All right, now I'm going to close the public hearing time. All right. Any other discussion on this item from the board? Mr. Chair, I'd like to vote that we approve resolution 062623-05. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Davis. Second by Mr. Scott. Roll call vote, Mr. Davis. Yes. Mr. Scott. Yes. Ms. Parker. Yes. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Ms. Bansley. Yes. Mr. Sharp. Yes. Chair votes yes. Motion passes. That moves us now to our action and discussion items. First up is the consideration of a resolution initiating amendments to the zoning ordinance for short term rentals. That's resolution R062623 06. Mr. Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Jordan Mitchell, Director of Community Development, uh, by presenting the zoning ordinance text amendments that are proposed for short term rental. Planning Commission has worked long and hard on these text amendments for the past several months. We've done a lot of research to staff, um, talking to other localities around the state, seeing how they're handling certain aspects of short term rental complaints. We're able to pick up some nice ideas from some of the ones um, around that were very similar to us. So, one of the two main reasons, and this isn't the only reasons, but these are the two main reasons um, that we're proposing to amend the short-term rental ordinance. One is enforcement, and as we kind of go through the, the proposed changes, I can kind of tell you some of the pitfalls as we go through that. And the, the big driver is Code of Virginia. The Code of Virginia has specific requirements for um, the registry. And there's an exception in there for the realtor community uh, to not have to register. And, uh, and there's also a limit on the fine that you can um, 
charge someone for a failure to register the short-term rental. So first, you know, what's going to remain in the ordinance? Still going to be the same zoning district that it's going to apply to. AP, AR, AV, R1, R2, C1, C2, PCD, and PRD. The limitation on overnight guests will remain two adults per bedroom. Age of the adult for ordinance purposes, two, two years of age. There'll still be a requirement for a fire extinguisher in an accessible area of the home. Working smoke detectors in the bedrooms and in the rooms outside the bedrooms is a requirement of the ordinance. Parking the boats and trailers on the lot of the, of the dwelling unit. And there's also no proposed changes to the requirement that there be no change to the outside appearance of a dwelling unit of the premise or premise. Can you clarify so, on that? I'm sorry. You bet adults per bedroom. Is it per, per, per septic permit or just bedroom? I'm going to get into that okay. with, with, right. the, with, the, the, with some of the changes. And, um, and it's a two-year-old two year establishes. Two-year-old is considered an adult per ordinance. Yes. We had a lengthy discussion with you all at a point last year when we initiated the first set of text amendments to this where I think the Planning Commission was, were, was trying to move that to three. And uh, the, the board said that they thought the two was the, the appropriate number. So we, they kept that from that ordinance. And do you have one other question? Um, and maybe you're going to get to it. And if you are, then, then okay. tell me. Um, you said overnight guest only. So and does that mean there's no limitation during the day? Yes. Um, seems to me you're, it's easier to enforce during the day than it is. Much, much. Totally agree. I mean, you're not gonna you're gonna be knocking on somebody's door at 11 o'clock at night. When we go when I, when I get to a couple of later slides, that'll be one of the questions at the very end to see if it's something that you all want to do okay. as a board. Um, but that's something the planning commission didn't recommend as part of this. But they were open to listening to you all if you wanted to recommend a daytime limit. So don't don't disagree with that at all. It's it's the, the hard part of this ordinance when it comes to that enforcement side is that uh, the majority of our violations are violations during the day that technically don't violate our short-term rental ordinance. We have to wait until overnight occurs. Okay. So the first proposed change we have in the ordinance is we're going to currently remove our definition of short-term rental from the ordinance. We are just simply going to go with the definition that the Code of Virginia spells out for a short-term renter that will be included in the ordinance and an operator. I feel like covers everybody that could possibly be renting out a short-term rental as well as a good description of what that is. So proposed changes, the registry, it'll be yearly. So I think we're, we're kind of been accustomed to um, the permits that kind of just go on forever for a long time. And according with the Code of Virginia, if you're going to keep up with short-term rentals and you're going to require the people to get permits from you all, uh, register, it has to be a yearly registry. So everybody's permit every year will have to be re-upped. Then there's the registry exemption. So the one that's most common is the first one. The first bullet is a persons that is licensed by a real estate board or a property owner that is represented by a real estate licensee. So that means that if I own a property and I am renting that out through a real estate company, I don't have to register. But it does not mean that I don't have to comply with the other requirements of the ordinance. Okay. So We'll have a registry, a yearly registry, the folks that are managing their own short-term rentals that don't meet this exemption requirement. And then we'll have another list that will be kept uh, in the office that we will have to go through and make sure they're complying with our ordinance. So it's kind of the way it's set up um, by the way the Code of Virginia kind of allows this exemption. We would love for them all just to register. It'd be a lot easier for us. But we'll have to keep up with two lists. I won't go through the rest. They're a little more uncommon. Rarely do we see the, the other three play out. Proposed fine change. So, our, our, currently, our ordinance is a $500 civil penalty for failure to, to register a failure to register a short-term rental. That process to go through the civil penalty process is a little long. We would prefer just to make the registration fee when you fail to register $500. That's the penalty. Very easy for us to collect the fee. Any questions on that? So, no real change. Just a change in how we are taking that fee in. So. John Doe fails to register his property. We get a complaint. He's, he's operating a short-term rental. We can prove that. When he comes in to register that property, he'll have to pay a $500 registration fee. How do you find, how do you find them? Oh, I've, I get tons of complaints all the time. Okay. But if somebody's registering and they haven't done it before, they're going to have to also pay the $500? When you say that again, I'm sorry? 
the registration fee is going to be 500 whether you you no. fail to register or not no. fail to the folks that are that do the right thing and register is a 50 dollar per 50 dollar oh, fee gotcha. so this okay. is for the folks that just simply are not abiding by the rules understood okay and if they produce evidence that they are managed by a realtor then they're we're, exempt that's correct yeah then what they're exempt they'll go on that other list yes now, I assume that the realtor pays the fee on that individual property, right? When you say fee, what are you referring to? The registration fee. No, there, there is no registration fee if you're represented by a realtor, so I can't charge them that. They just simply fall on that other list of trying to keep up with everything they do yearly. I guess the point is uh, it's to try to make sure that things are being done right. appropriately. If they're registered with a realtor, then theoretically the realtor is the one responsible Yes. they are the ones doing it appropriately correct if they're doing a diy then they have to register with you and yes. then you go over the rules with them. that's correct yes sir but so there, you, um, go ahead would you say on the other list would that be the list for the transient occupancy tax oh list? yeah we'll still collect transient occupancy tax that's so not a problem the we'll, commissioner's office is automatically going to have that list too I'm still trying to figure out how we will collect that information. More than likely, we'll create another permit type in the system where we'll register it through there just so we can give them access to that information on real time. Uh, but it won't actually be an active permit in our system and um, it won't be out there. You know, Obviously, it's for FOIA purposes. The list is available for FOIA anyway. So we just have to have a way to track it and make it easy to track it. So, so I, we, just have to ha we have to have this exemption because this is what the state does? You have no choice. I wish there was a choice because we require them all to register. Okay. Yeah. No, Much I mean, we, the, yeah, okay. Yep. We, yeah, the real estate lobby is, if you know, uh, this year they tried to amend the short term rental regulations to make them exempt from not only registering, but all the requirements that we have to for them. That was shot down, though, so it never got to be possibly enacted. So, real estate lobby is strong in Richmond. Uh, disposal. Proposed changes for privately operated sewage disposal system. So all properties must provide a copy of the VDH approved sewage disposal system serving the dwelling. Currently, we only require that for dwellings that are within 500 feet of the 795 contour of Smith Mountain Lake. Planning Commission felt that what was good for those folks should be good for everybody that has a septic system. We shouldn't just care about this system failing or being overloaded on the lake. We should care countywide. So that's why that's requirements there. Evidence that the septic tank be pumped out within three years is in the ordinance. Applicants are currently required to submit evidence of a septic tank being pumped out or inspected. So, or inspected will not be an option anymore within five years. To clarify, at each annual renewal, that criteria would be checked. If we have a septic permit or septic pump evidence that's been within three years, mm -hmm. But if it is expired, then they'd have to produce yes. evidence of a, okay. Yes, sir. Or if it's close, we may say, well, you know, you're a month off, we'll put in our, we'll have a thing in there basically to go and recheck that in a month. Just okay, to make so sure that's my question to you is if, if, they, if they haven't had it done, what's the penalty? There is no penalty. It's just they'll have to go do that before we we'll let them register. Uh, this for all short-term rentals? Like this is all. Somebody yes. lives out on a farm way away from the lake. Yes. Yep. Yes. If I ran out my basement bedroom. If you're on a septic system, you'd be required, yes. Yep. This is a state law? No, this is this is simply our law that we've created. If I'm not mistaken, this was we used to do five years, uh, at the time we adopted the original ordinance that kind of went through the public hearing process that kind of stopped at the planning commission this was one of the changes that was in that one that was authorized by the board at that time <clears throat> so it can be changed if you want to so to when you. we started off this was concerns around the lake not all the way around the whole county right it's up to you you could require that within a certain you know you could move in the 500 feet of the 795 contour into that requirement if you want to I do think that, or maybe you require the ones uh, that are not and within that certain feet to allow them to also have it inspected. At least we would know if we're issuing the permit of the system is failing or not, per 
the inspection of the permit. That's a lot cheaper too. What percentage of our short-term rentals are within the 500 feet or whatever? The Probably like 80%. 80? Yeah. Okay. I don't know why you wouldn't have it in the whole county then. Because it's pro I'm guessing there's probably pockets in the county of short-term rentals. It's not, I mean, is, is that right? Like, well, there's I, quite a few I, in I forest. suspect you have some in forest that right. they, they may only do it like the week of graduation for Liberty right. University, right? So it's like one week. We'll do it before and after, you know. Uh, so there's still leaves. That, that might be overkill for, for a situation. There's, there's like several that. up the peaks. Yep. Up that one. There's several up the peaks. Yeah, we have a lot around the peaks. Forest is the other area that's probably about the other 10, and the rest of them are kind of spread out throughout the county. Man, I know people have said, you know, I could pay my mortgage for a couple of months just written it mm -hmm. for a week for Liberty graduation. What would be the opposition to having it countywide? I'm, I'm not sure I follow. Well, just like, I don't know who said it about a bedroom in the basement. I just think it's overkill. Maybe for the, for the bedroom in the basement, but, but would you would you lose on it heavy on the other side? If you didn't have it countywide. I mean, if you had people going five years and they needed it every three years, and then they have a back up overflow that's affecting. How about the the fact the old saying that many have forgotten one bad apple spoils the whole bunch? You know, an abuse of our uh, county's. Uh, beauty and so forth it has led to this problem and does everybody here understand when a septic system is is overly used as the examples that we had here this evening with 12 people being put in homes that weren't suitable for that when you put that many people in a ho home what you're doing is you're adding a huge overflow of water to that septic tank and when you fill that septic tank up to the brim the solids that are in and this is fact I'm speaking fact when a septic tank fills up with water, the solids that are in that tank float to the top, which they're not intended to do. They're intended to, to break down. Correct, Mr. Mitchell? Yep, and it'll end up down the line, which would essentially they, cause the system to So the to solids fail flow into yeah. the distribution box, and the distribution box is, distributes the, the effluent, not the solid waste, to the drain field dishes. And when the solids get into the drain field ditches, the ditches are plugged up, stopped up. And that, at that point, your drain field continues to lose more and more uh, square footage, which yeah. is how they're built. And, and ultimately, that drain field is useless. So if, if I owned a place for short-term rentals, whether I was going to overstock it with people or not, I would pump that tank out at the end of the season. Why would you want to take a chance and destroy your ability to make a livelihood on a property or, you know, or a home that you may live in with, without properly having it pumped when it needs it? And, and over $350 to do it. It makes no sense. And, and I think we're spending a lot of time on, on something that it should be a slam dunk. Yeah, I mean, the health department does recommend three to five years as the typical pump out just for a regular home use. It's not inclusive of short term rental, depending upon how and many people you do have living in your dwelling. So um, we're certainly in the, the realm here of a normal pump out process. Also, one of your strategic priorities is countywide pump out. So this would be making a little bit of progress, at least towards that, for certain types of uses. Well, I agree with what he's saying, but some people don't need it pumped as quite often as we're trying to say they need it pumped. And I'm, <clears throat> I personally, pump my set, I, I put it on my calendar. I pump it every three years. I have no problems, anything. But I don't want Fairfield County coming in there telling me I need to pump it every three years. Are you doing short-term rentals? No, but I'm talking about privately. But it's just every time we turn around, we just put more regulation, more government telling you what to do, and all that. Just, just get tired of it. I pump it every four years because I do it during a presidential election. It kind of reminds me it's time <laughs> to pump. <laughs> Say it. Is that the because of all the good. crap that's that out there? Good. Yeah. <laughs> But no, I think from, like I said, if, if you want to change the requirements for those that aren't within that certain amount of feet at, at the lake, 
you, know, you certainly can do that, and we can make that a part of the ordinance. If, you know, like I said, a lot of times um, we've seen some of these. I've seen some people submit inspections that say their system is failing and want me to issue a permit for them for, which we won't. Um, they have to get that addressed before we'll do that and get a clean bill of health. But the inspection sometimes can come back a little bad for the property owner as well. Would it be um, agreeable if it's a non-lakefront property? That it's at least an inspection every three. I'm fine with that. Yep. And what's the inspection entail? Like, just walk her and say, "Have you had your septic tank?" I think they put a dye pack. Yeah. It used to be that. It's a little bit more. Do run the water for an hour. Go outside, make sure it's ground's not soggy. Hop around in the yard, make sure it's not soggy or what. That's Everything's one, that's soggy right now. I, yeah. That's one way. Yeah. I go along with that, but I just think that it's always overkill. So every five years for properties that are, or every three years? I think you said two. three. Three. But that's an ins inspection. Yep. If it's waterfront, it's pump. Or within 500 feet? Yeah, within 500 feet. Well, let me ask you a question. This is only for short-term rentals, right? right? Right. Why don't we have all the property owners around Smith Mountain Lake have their septic tanks pumped instead of trusting them to go ahead and do it? That's basically the same thing. Well, we're saying. It's part of your strategic priorities is that you want that. You what? Know, it's part of your strategic priorities that you want a countywide pump-out program. We can get there. That's a that's a that's a large undertaking. This is <laughs> this is uh, you know. I would estimate we have about uh, 450 to 550 uh, short-term rentals, you know, because we have some of the old ones that kind of carried over that aren't in our current permitting cycle. They're part of our conversion permits. Um, yeah, we can get there. I, I don't disagree with you, and I think that's part of the board's priorities is to get to that point. I agree with that. Both Franklin and Pennsylvania County require it every five years. I'm just saying if we're going to dictate to one was to keep the person that's not short-term rental to abuse and let the sewage run over? Well, I'll, I'll, let me get back. To, so Mr. Sharp asked a great question earlier, you know, are we going to regulate the daytime occupancy? So if you were going to regulate daytime occupancy, maybe you don't need to do this because then you're just talking about normal use of a dwelling. Something else to consider. This is really just because they're, you know, during the day, we're not, rec we're not regulating how many people can be on the property. You could have a party going on from, you know, dawn to, to dusk, and uh, they could be using the restroom in the, in the property, overburdening the septic system for what it's able to handle. And as Mr. You know, Davis pointed out, you know, you're going to have some system failure from that or shorten the life of the septic system. I just realized there's benefits to being antisocial. <laughs> we can re we can circle back around to this. I've got, I wrote down the changes I'm that okay you. I'm okay with it every three years. Okay. I just was asking about the bedroom in the basement. I don't have a bedroom in the basement. Well, Mr. Sharp does bring up a good point. You know, uh, Smith Mountain Lake probably has more of the whole home being rented out, and it's more of a you know. We're starting to see a lot more uh, rentals, um, not just in the summer months. We're starting to see a lot more in the winter months now, especially with COVID. Um, a lot more people come to the lake year round. Um, whereas the short term rentals in forests, you know, as you mentioned, um, I think there's one in my neighborhood, for instance, and it, they simply only rent it out for graduation weekend every year. So in my business, we service short term rentals and they're all over Bedford County. They're not just at Smith Mountain Lake. Um, a lady called me the other day with Airbnb on Leesville Road in Lynchburg. So I think you're overburdening Jordan, Mr. Mitchell's department by trying to segregate if they're at the lake or not. I worry It'll that that doesn't just complicate it. It's, huh? I worry that that just complicates it. Well, I mean, it. just keep it simple. Short-term rentals every three years. Okay. I mean... Uh, maybe you guys know more about drain fields than I did. Maybe I wasted my breath explaining how they work when they get overburdened. But from, from if I owned one, I would pump it, like I said, at the end of the season every year because for what you're generating in revenue, what you stand to lose by you know allowing your drain field to be 
saturated beyond capacity, your place is going to be condemned for crying out loud. I don't get it. Mr. Chairman, do you want me to circle back around with this at the end? Well, what is your pleasure? I've, I've been fine with three years. Three years for every, as is here? I was all right. I was just offering, there were other thoughts. Are you talking about three years pump or three years inspection? Um, I was good with three years pump. It's going to cost you just as much to get an inspection as it is to pump it. Right. Not a hill I'm going to die on. I'm not, me neither. I'm me either. Three years plump, okay. it's fine. Kickoffs right. in leave it as Leave it as is. All right. Sorry, I brought it up. It's Sorry. okay. Uh, public sewer. So our ordinance has kind of had an implied uh, maximum overnight occupancy for public sewer. So we wanted to make it very specific and, and, and kind of carve out how that is. But it will remain the same. Two people, uh, two adults per bedroom. And the capacity should be based off the certificate of occupancy for the dwelling. You know, of course, we'll be looking here the number of bedrooms on that certificate of occupancy. This is probably the biggest change of the ordinance. This is the property maintenance plan. So the property maintenance plan uh, is going to be required for anybody that's operating a short-term rental to demonstrate how they are managing it. So it will include the following, a floor plan of the dwelling. We want to know where the bedrooms are in the house. Can't tell you how many complaints I get from folks that are listing the, the living room as a bedroom online. So this, is, this will tell us exactly where these bedrooms are in the house that they say that they have. And of course, we'll be able to match that up with the building official as well in our current CO, as well as the septic permit. But it'll also have local points of contact, response to complaints, garbage disposal, tenant management, number of permitted overnight guests is on that, uh, parking, parking information, location of fire extinguishers, or smoke detectors in house, utility contact information, any other additional information that we need to ensure compliance with the ordinance. So if we miss something here, we can still ask for it later on down the road if we find a big problem. Would this um, maintenance plan also include any owner direction as far as the maximum capacity? Yes. For both day and night? Yeah, it could if you want to move forward with, a, with an occupancy limitation for the day. Yes. Right now, it'll just be the way this ordinance is written now, uh, as the Planning Commission only recommended, the regulation of overnight guests. Well, not necessarily saying that we have an ordinance on daytime, mm -hmm. but if we did. Yes. But if we don't, if the property owner places a maximum, would it be found in this plan? Yes. So, I mean, the property owner, let's say we would allow six and the property owner wants to allow four, yeah, that's up to them to tell us. As long as it's less, equal to or less, we'd be okay with that. So pretty much, I like this, because pretty much they have to have a management. Yes. They have to have someone who could, that you can call for complaints. Yes, and the next slide will explain to you the other caveat to this that we'll have as well. But this, this maintenance plan is going to be posted in the dwelling at a, in a, at a very common location. And uh, it'll also be provided to the rental as part of their tenant agreement. Signs. We remove the, allow, the allowable outdoor signage for short-term rentals. Reason being, if you can't change the appearance of the home, why would you allow someone to stick a sign in their front yard calling attention to the short-term rental? The whole idea there is that the home should look like a residential dwelling that is not being enrolled in a short-term rental program. So, you know, currently we do allow for signage two square feet in R1 and R2. AP, AR, and AV, we allow for a 16 square foot sign. Both of those types of signs are not illuminated signs. So, so we would just remove that allowance. <coughs> <from the ordinance. coughs> that signage would have been specific to saying this is a short-term rental. It's, it doesn't prohibit like Eagle's Nest or whatever it is they name their little. Place. So if they have their house called the Eagle's Nest and they're advertising the Eagle's Nest as a bed and breakfast uh, or excuse me, a short term rental in a neighborhood, we would probably tell them that that would not be allowed. Yeah, but there's like I know there's one going up towards the peaks. And it's on a really, you know, it's really wooded lot and they have a sign there that's lit up. How are people going to know when to turn? You're coming in at night for that for that Airbnb unless they have some kind of sign. It's just not a road. It's just a you know a driveway. You could always leave the allowance in for the APA or a, an AV. That would be the. I think the big deal here is our, our residential neighborhoods that are R1, R2. That's usually one of the bigger complaints we got too. My neighbor's got a bunch of signs in the front yard. You know, um, it's devaluing my property. It's, it's very apparent that there's a short-term rental going on. So. 
you know, that would so be. So we more. could just say no outdoor signage permitted in R1 and R2? Short-term rule prohibition. So currently right now, we say upon three or more violations of local, state ordinances pertaining to the property offered for short-term rental, the county may prohibit such property being registered as a short-term rental. So what we're proposing to do here with this ordinance is, is that the Code of Virginia says that it has to be more than three. So it can't be three or more, it has to be more than three. So this ordinance will have more than three. And we also set a limitation um, on how long they will be prohibited from registering as a short as a uh, short term rental. So two years max would be the, the maximum that you would allow that. But prohibited. it says the county may that gives you right. discretion, right? Why wouldn't we just say the county will? So you have a violator that's doing everything that you to your ordinance. They've got the maintenance plan. Then there's human nature where they bring eight people down to the lake and they're on a, you know, four, you're on a two bedroom home. Um, hard for me to hold the pull the short term rental when the applicants got the advertisement correct and everything that they've doing is correct per the letter of the law. Human nature kind of takes effect and we would just go down there and tell them that's cast a stop and we would count it towards and you said this you need to try to rectify this and make it very clear with your your tenants. For instance, you know, I to get a hotel room, you know, a lot of people will get a hotel room and husband and wife and they leave the conveniently leave the kids off, you know, the the list there, you know, just to try not to have to pay the extra fees. Um, Sometimes the, the tenant can be disingenuous with uh, the short term rental in general. We would have to find that though. So that's the thing. So if you're out there advertising and we catch you out there advertising for, you know, 12 people and, and we're only, and the permit says they're only allowed to have six, then yeah, that's going to be a violation. And if that happens repeatedly, we're going to pull them the permit. It's the sheriff's it's office has a lot of problems with unruly parties going on at the property. Technically, that's a violation. So, and I, I feel like I know the answer to this, but this was a question I got. They want to know if it's going to be retroactive. It would not be. It, no. We cannot start this until this ordinance. Correct. Is yes. So day one, we'll probably have a lot of violations that we'll have to clean up online. Yes, sir. Uh, this is what I was mentioning earlier about the uh, the maintenance plan. So some other additional requirements that are in this code here. So prior registration and inspection of the dwelling unit offered for short term rental to verify compliance with all applicable requirements. So this is where we're gonna go through their uh, maintenance plan, make sure they're showing us everything correctly, show us the locations of the, the fire extinguisher, making sure the smoke detectors work in the home before we let it register. The only thing I will tell you is, is in the ordinance, I would re I'm gonna recommend that you remove prior to registration just to just say that it has to the inspection of the dwelling has to occur. Prior to registration would mean that that would only apply to uh, the folks that are having to register, not everyone. So we want to make sure that covers everybody. And of course, the last one there is the short-term rental permits because we're going to issue a zoning permit as part of the uh, official registration uh, when you're on the registry. It's only valid for one year. Are you going to have to do the inspections at every renewal? Yep. You got to add staff. I'm going to have to dedicate one of my staff members to doing only this, yes. And we're prepared to do it. You collect enough fees <clears throat> to cover it? Yep, I think so. Definitely in transient oxygen tax, yes. Yep. We want to try to help Tracy as much, too, in helping with the transient oxygen tax. So the better records we keep, the better opportunity she has to go after the folks that are not paying their fair share of taxes and for that. So. Yeah, I, I think the initial plan, Mr. Mitchell and I were talking about this the other day, they have a vacant planner position. And the thought was is that if this ordinance ends up getting adopted in some form or fashion later this summer, then we would transition that planner position into a code compliance position for this purpose, and we'd readdress a planner position in the future if we need it. Right. Is, is there a, for instance, the owner or the real estate company are doing a good job and they have no control. I mean, when they rent it out, they think this is a good person and all that, and that person violates these things. And let's just say they got in a fight and they called the sheriff out there. How, is it some kind of way of determining that the owner is trying to correct that or make sure it doesn't happen again without being in violation? 
Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't. Obviously, there's a human nature aspect of that, as I was mentioning. You know, uh, the owner, if the property owner and the and the operator of the short-term rental is doing everything they can to comply with the ordinance, um, we would be we would not be willing to pull the permit um, or not allow them to register just based off the fact of them simply. It's a judgment call. I mean, if I make a decision, citizen doesn't like it, they can always appeal that decision to the board of zoning appeals. So, they have the option to do that, and they can cert cert their case there, and I'll present my case as to why we did what we did. But during the inspection, besides you're looking for that they posted their rules, mm -hmm. what else are you looking for? Well, the big thing we're looking for is we want to get in there and we want to make sure where we know where the bedrooms are and we want to be able to have that staff member go through the, the Airbnb listing to make sure that they're not saying the bedrooms in another location of the house and it shouldn't be. So why would you have to do that every year? The bedrooms aren't going to change because the rental people change the ads every year or very often. And that's what we want to try to chase down. The ad, the, the short-term rental ads are the biggest enforcement nightmare we have. We, we're trying to go forth with, a, with a enforcement on that. So our ordinance is going to require that their advertisements of the short-term rental comply with the, with the permit we're issuing for registration. We can then go after the, uh, the ad and say, hey, you're not in compliance with our ordinance, strike one. You know. I guess I just don't understand. The house isn't going to change from year to year. The bedrooms aren't, I mean, there's going to be three, but unless they come to you and ask for a building permit to build a new sure. bedroom or to, you know, reconfigure the basement into another bedroom. Well, every year we just want to make sure by going into the dwelling that one, that they haven't added a bedroom to the house that they didn't get permits for. That very well can happen. Um, People finish their basements all the time without permits. Um, that would require an increase in the capacity of the septic system on the property. So we would be trying to get that resolved before we'd allow them to add that extra bedroom to the home. Uh, that's really what we're checking for. We're trying to make sure that people are out there um, doing what they said they're going to be doing on that management plan. I know it sounds crazy, but I can give you tons of examples of people's living rooms. Sleeps four, you know, in the living room. They're sleeping them. They'll sleep in the bathroom if you let them do it. So. Right now, our ordinance just doesn't go after that. We, we, we say that we have a two-bedroom home. You're allowed to have four people overnight. The problem is if we don't catch them actually in the action of doing that, I really can't go with an enforcement procedure. If the ad's out there where they're saying, hey, we, we can sleep 16 people overnight, well, I got you. Simple as that. Violation of the ordinance. Let's get them. But these properties that are managed by a real estate property firm or a realtor? We're still going to be asking for the, to do the same inspection, Jerry. Okay. But since they don't have a permit, we can't pull it. Right, but we'll have the we'll have the ads online that we'll have a we'll have to create our own registry from. Yeah. But if a realtor is not abiding by the rules, they can get in some serious. Their license. Yeah, they right. can have. They can it's lose our, their license. Our, our choice to go to the board of realtors with a complaint is that. We would, Patrick and I would probably go to court and we would slap them with civil fines too. We can slap civil penalties on them as well per the ordinance. This is a pretty comprehensive ordinance change. I mean, I, yep. we're kind of going to something that's going to be, um, you know, probably we should have done a long time ago. Uh, I think the citizens would probably tell you that too, the, especially the ones that call our office. And I repeatedly have to tell them that I can't find the violation and I know they're frustrated. So I think this ordinance will certainly help address. How long do you concerns. envision for this to shake out to where you will be? You have say eighty percent of it, four or five years. No, I don't think it'll be that long. I think the, I think within the first year we'll have it pretty much under control. Initially, it'll be. Initially, we'll probably have to have our other code enforcement officer kind of help out initially, just to kind of make sure. Because like I said, there's there's probably. I'd say over half of them probably are listed online as being out of compliance, if not more than that. So it's a lot of letters we're going to send out. So the uh, two additional questions the Planning Commission did and ask. By the way, yep. it's based on septic bedrooms, not. That's what I'm saying. That's why I don't understand the, ins that's why I don't understand the inspection. Uh, I, well, this is the part that I'm, that I'm trying to get clear so in our ordinance it's going to be based on bedrooms bedrooms or septic 
septic rated. The bedrooms from the certificate of occupancy, which if it's on sewer, it's certificate of occupancy, which will be the number of bedrooms listed on that. If it's on a septic system, the septic system will determine the amount of bedrooms in that dwelling that are eligible for a short term rental. So we will then be doing the, the maintenance plan would show us which bedrooms they're renting out as part of that. So it's based on the certificate of occupancy. But both it can be does both. not your certificate of occupancy also cover so that side? They should match. Yes. Now we do have some properties in the lake where there may or may not be a CO for. We've sometimes had difficulty when you go back to the 60s and 70s to find some of them. But well, in that case, the, self, the health department typically has the record. So the, the two questions, as I mentioned to you earlier, the Planning Commission did not put these in the ordinance. However, um, they were questions that the citizens certainly had or wanted or desired. The second one is more or less a, a question more of philosophy from you all. Uh, but daytime occupancy restrictions, is this something you want to do? I don't know that we've ever been able to figure out a way to do that and what the number would be. You know, I know we threw out the, uh, last year we threw out the two people per bedroom plus, you know, per thousand square foot in the home, you got an extra person or so. If you want to move forward with that, that's okay. Um, the second question, limit the amount of short-term rentals in the county. The reason we ask that question is, is because we've really grown a lot in short-term rentals. Uh, I want to say during COVID, we went from couple hundred permits to you know somewhere between 450 to 500 so 200 plus new permits of short-term rental have been enrolled at some point in time that will cause your housing prices to artificially inflate but if you limit the number of short-term rentals in the county and you've got let's say you're capped out right now and you've got somebody that's been doing it for two years mm -hmm. and they want to apply and you say they can they go well, fine we'll just keep doing it I wouldn't recommend you set a cap of like where we're at now. I would say you probably said like maybe we'll only allow a thousand of them or something like that. But you know, long term, that'll have its effects on your real estate because, like you, as Mr. Sharp was saying, I mean, if you can rent your house out for the week of the lake, I mean, that, you're paying your mortgage for the year if you rent it out for maybe a couple months of the summer. So, big investment, about a lot of money being made. Well, I think it's a good question. I mean, you can invest in a real investment, real estate investment trust with any brokerage firm that at one point was simply buying large, you know, shopping malls or whatever, which now is, I guess, the thing in the past. But as, as we move forward, I mean, I just did some work for a man whose son and daughter-in-law moved out to Billings. And they're buying houses out there and doing short-term rentals. And it's a free country. You can do what you want to. But at the same time, I think um, I know that I'd like my kids to be able to continue to live here in Bedford County and I'm not none of them wants to live on a quarter acre postage stamp they like their privacy and they like a, a nice size lot and in and, and so I think we need to take some of these things into consideration moving forward there may come a point when we should consider the sure. limiting these oh. I, I, I can't say that I'm for limiting the number of short-term rentals I'm just, I'm a free market capitalist and that's not going to change. Um, however, I am for uh, daytime occupancy yep. restrictions. I mean, I, when you're going to enforce this, you're going to enforce it during the day, you're not going to enforce it at night. I mean, we're, we're not going to have anything that's enforceable if we don't have the daytime occupancy so restrictions. My question I'm is not for doing that to somebody, you know, if somebody owns and it's not a short term rental. You know, if somebody wants to have a party, you have a party, right? But you're not having a party every day. But so you see somebody having a party over there, and the occupants, what do we do? Go up and ask them, are you, are you renting our own? I mean, it's they would know. We, yeah, we would. So yeah. the neighbors. I, I've got the neighbors do a lot of the work for us. Yeah. Holding a standard for short-term rentals that's not held to the same standard for homeowners. I just includes you know, the code. If it's, if it's a limit. Of, if you're making too much noise, you're making too much noise whether you own the property or whether you're... What do you do if uh, they rent the house for a week? They have family in Lynchburg and family wants to come up one day and have a birthday party. You going to limit that? I think that's probably one of the reasons we don't have a limit now. Yeah. Is because that's such a hard thing to manage. If you wanted to have that one-off event, you'd almost have to create a another type of notification for that event if it happened that way, but I don't think you really want to do that either because, like you said, it's kind of an impromptu thing or maybe not even be planned out. The problem is... It's not enforceable. 
Yeah, we just have hard. This the bad actors are the ones that mess all this up. You know, the people who aren't you know just bringing a huge crowd there that that's not the problem. It's the it's the one-offs that you know, they don't care, they don't live there. And then usually it's going to be a, a, a bad actor that's, sure. you know, that's renting. I think, I think your problem is mostly solved with our code about the limit of people that are going to be there and the septic. I mean, one, if you solve that problem, if you can only have two adults per bedroom, you're not going to have a place over there that's got a two-bedroom place with 12 cars in the driveway. You're going to... Can we put a time limit on that two per bedroom after nine o'clock? Well, my, my recommendation was going to be as to when, when did, you know, one thing that our ordinance also doesn't, you know, state is, is we never been able to really decide when overnight starts. You know, is that, exactly. uh, is that 10, we, 11, 12? When is it? Yeah. Can we put a time when sure. overnight is? Mm -hmm. is it, then we wouldn't have to worry about the daytime because at nine o'clock, if they have more than that. Sure. That probably needs to coincide with the and yes, what I was going to say, we, if you do it, always it, done. it needs to coincide. Yeah. But my other comment on this is since 80% of these are out at the lake, the majority are in the HOA, Homeowners Association. If they want this to be more restrictive, they absolutely, as an HOA, can do that and not involve us. I'm, I'm not keen on daytime occupancy limits. But if the HOA wants to do that, have at it because if it is truly the majority of the people that believe that they'll get their 75 percent and they can get that done if they want to restrict daytime occupancies in their homeowner association if they don't have an hoa and they live on a private street like same group i've been listening to for six years they can form one again if the majority of the homeowners agree with that they have the ability to set one up I do think that if you did not establish a daytime occupancy restriction, we I feel pretty good that some of the changes we are making are going to kind of change, you know, the dynamic of how they're being rented out. You know, your your tenants coming to the property, you're going to kind of know that well, I'm renting a six bedroom house, you know, and my family's got 18 people to bring down. Well, that's not going to work, you know. So um, I think that that will help, kind of the problem in itself, um, especially with the manager of the plan and putting the property owners on notice that failure to register is going to be a problem for them. So giving you my two cents worth and one of the reasons talking to some of the other localities, they've none of, I have not yet found a locality that I've spoken with that has adopted stricter short term rental regulations that regulate daytime occupancy. Overnight, yes, daytime, no. And the overnight will take care of a lot of the daytime. I think so, but I think there's just some properties where you just have some party houses at the lake that are just kind of you know, like you know some neighborhoods also have so many short-term rentals in it it's almost impossible to establish an well, HOA. It's not like we can't come back and revise. Well, it. sure, we can try this, see if it works, and uh, like. if it doesn't work, we will. I think Mr. Tuck said it best. You know, when we adopt the last ones, you know, this is a good start. And we'll see where it goes. Absolutely. Um, I did talk with my counterpart in Franklin County, and. Uh, they run theirs through Granicus, who does all this search stuff for them to mm -hmm. see if they're registered, unregistered, and all that. That may be worth, might be cheaper than hiring someone else to do some of this, but, um, or maybe not. I don't. I've talked to Lisa about it too, and I think that they pay a lot of money for that, and I don't know that they saw the return on it as much. Okay. So. It's also a little more impersonal because they handle the the enforcement side too as well. They kind of send out generic letters. Uh, they can also you know, work with Tracy to collect taxes too as well. Um, my suggestion would be to see how we do it. If we can't handle it, and we need help, then we have a choice to make. You know, as far as getting that software to help and or hiring another employee maybe to help deal with it. But I think we should be able to handle it with what we have. Getting a person dedicated to it will help. Personally, I'm against those two. Now, the Planning Commission was adamantly against the second one, which is the limit on, on the amount of short-term rentals in the county. 
uh, the first one they were a little more amenable to hearing even though they didn't recommend it so it's up to you all is there anything in here about cars I saw parking I, I saw yeah. about the boats yeah was it it said park cars I did say cars so it was trailers and trailers, uh, and, boats trailers and boats have to be parked on, on the, the lot prop. does that mean they can park in the grass sure the management plan should also show the parking area in it too so where, where are your tenants parking on the site so we'd be looking for three you know if you got a three bedroom home you know you're looking for you know at least three parking spots maybe in the house so these dwelling units supposed to have two parking spaces anyway whether it be in the garage or outside the house it's kind of a requirement of the ordinance so we'll be making sure that they at least have some kind of adequate off-street parking I saw at some point though that you said something about cars too. The cars couldn't be parked on the road; that they had to have be on the, on the driveway. No, they didn't blocking. have all the. They can't impede traffic. I think you're um, referring to the management plan here, where we have, we asked for them for the parking information. Okay. So we want to be making sure they park on the property. Yeah. Okay. Obviously, at all your parking. And that's going to help too. Yeah. That's going to help the number. The way that the management plan is written, it's really up for us to figure out because every property will be different at the lake you'll have some really steep properties you'll have some flatter properties some are going to have more of a difficulty of parking several cars on the property gives us the ability to the flexibility to be able to look at the how they're managing the permit and see if it's something we think is feasible all right. Any other questions? Well, that's that's all i have this this resolution is basically to send it back to planning commission to schedule the public hearing the first of two the first yes. of two yes we have an anticipated date be the first planning commission meeting in august and then we would get it at our last meeting in august yeah, yeah. I, I, mr jordan mr jordan <laughs> mr mitchell and i were talking about this uh the other day and yeah we, we, tentatively speaking we're talking about august 1st yes for planning commission then August 28th for the Board of Supervisors. Yep. Assuming the Planning Commission makes a recommendation on the first. Yep. Yeah, so that's all tentative, depending on what happens after all, on August 1st. We have discussed a number of points, and unfortunately, I can't recall what <laughs> we may have changed along the way. Um, uh, the, the ones that I have written down were that you wanted to uh, stay with the uh, pump out requirements three years for all short term rentals. Um, the other one was to allow signage in the AP, AR, and AV zoning districts for properties. Um, no other changes that I wrote down to the ordinance. If I missed something, let me know. Okay. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I've got full confidence he hasn't missed anything. And I'd like to make a motion that we approve resolution R062623 06. Second. All right, we have a motion by Mr. Johnson, seconded by Mr. Davis. This is a roll call. Mr. Davis. Yes. Mr. Scott. Yes. Ms. Parker. Yes. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Ms. Bansley. Yes. Mr. Sharp. Yes. Chair votes yes. Motion passes. That moves us on to consideration of a resolution approving amendments to the zoning ordinance regarding the establishment of a halfway house. Resolution R062623-07. Mr. Mitchell. I don't have a presentation for this one. This was really simple. Um, I think you had some speakers at your last meeting, and I think the school board has been unanimous in their opposition to having a halfway house within a proximity of uh, a school. So we did draft up an ordinance amendment here, which would prohibit that use from within one mile of, a, of one of our public schools. Mr. Chair, yes. uh, I have a question for that. Is there any reason why we can't make that both private and public? A longer distance? Sure. Like five miles? Sure. A mile would be Why pretty would normal with some one other. One well, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying you can't have one in Bedford County without saying that. I support that. We have one, but it has to be in a remote place. I would suggest five miles. Five miles? How far is Galax? <laughs> I would suggest that we don't have one in this county. I mean, let's let's pick a remote place. What if somebody wants to? I live on 65 acres. So suppose somebody wants to put one next to me. I don't want one near me, and no one else would either. Well, this doesn't mean it can happen. It just means it's. That's right. 
This is just a restriction. So we have, you know, it's a standard. So you have to meet this standard in order to be able to even, even get apply. to the application apply. process. Right. So if you're within five miles of a school, using that as an example, public school, I, I thought you may be wanting to add private to that, and that's up to you all. Uh, yeah, actually, I was going to suggest parks. Parks. Okay. All right. All right, done. Second motion. Private, public, parks. All right. Okay. So well, I, I, I would like to make a motion that whoa, we whoa, modify. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, sorry. Miss <laughs> <laughs> Parker's got. I'm warm. just trying to get ahead of it. <laughs> <laughs> she warmed up. <laughs> no, I, I, want, I have some other questions that I want to bring up and it's related to this topic. And while we're sending something forward to get some added regulations, can we add maybe a couple more? Sure. So right now, as we know, this um, halfway house has pulled the special use permit, but they are currently still utilizing the property. Uh, I mean, I don't know. That's just what we're hearing, and that the people that they have uh, technically three dwellings, call them single family dwellings, whatever, but three areas that they by our zoning ordinance are allowed to have four unrelated people living in each so they have three so that means 12. so now it's almost like we've gone from asking permission to do 16 to not getting permission and doing 12. and what they've taken off the table is the clinical a part of it so now it's not a halfway house it's just a single family dwelling it's with, a short-term rental yes yeah <laughs> exactly it's it's so and then i'm looking in the ordinance and trying to think about well it's almost like they're circumventing but and then i'm going well this is more like this is not a single family dwelling with four unrelated, and I know why we put that in the ordinance before was before, was for college type situations where you wanted to rent your house out for for college students. Um, so I have a couple questions. What about if you have in this case where we know what's going on? Who's paying the rent? Are they getting rent from? from some sort of medical, from insurance. insurance, because that kicks that in a whole different category. No, it's what it is, insurance. Um, so that's my first question. These are things I want looked into. Um, we haven't had time to even, but what, now that we're, we, we need to have some regulations on this, obviously, because they're circumventing the regulations that we do have because we don't have any. Right. Um, so that's my first question. You've got four unrelated, and in this case, we know that it's a, it was a facility, now it's, well, we're just renting to four individuals per household, 12. Mm -hmm. Where's the money coming from? And um, doesn't that, since it's not a halfway house, you're not doing medical there, or that's what they're saying, would that not kick it into the, another category of like a boarding house, which also requires a special use permit? Right. So those two things in particular, while we're you know doing this, I want also added into this while mm -hmm. we're we're um, modifying our halfway house in the ordinance, and we also want to look look into it. Is it doesn't this kick it into a boarding house technically because it's you're removing the medical part, but still, if it's a boarding house, then it requires a special use permit. Right, correct. So those are the two things that I thought about in addition to the distance from the school and the parks. Have we been out there? We're working on it. Uh, I have, uh, I, we are, working an enforcement case on this obviously based on the assertions of the citizens that are in the area i have had some communications with um Sobrius. Uh, mr stevens is no longer their ceo so we've been dealing with doug fullaway um, mr fullaway has sent me an email basically saying they're not doing the partial hospital uh, hospital 
partial hospital. I'm gonna I'm gonna mess this up. Come here, come here. She's <laughs> she's my expert. She's done a lot of research into this. So, what is it? What is the program called? I'm it's sorry. the partial hospitalization program. It's their 2.5 ASAM program. So they would be renting the home, and then they would not be doing any of the counseling in the home. So it's just used for rental for them to stay there. No drug administration? No, no, administ no. no. It's just for them to, to live there, and then they'll go and actually do the program on a different property. It just seems to me Wait, that they are just, just. I don't know what you just, you just said just what I just said. They're using it for the same person. Purpose. They're just Similar not purpose. doing the it's clinical treatment. part there. Right, not doing the treatment. But it's there. the same people that are in our, yeah, you're providing them a place to live. Yeah, the, the graduates of the, the partial, partial hospitalization program are the ones who are the renters. Yes. And I think Mr. Fullaway was pretty honest in telling us that. I don't like it. <laughs> yes. I mean, I don't know what yeah, I mean, that seems like it, everyone already came out against it, and this just seems like flies in the face basically like well we're just going to do it and what are you going to do about it they got smart lawyers but they're not smarter than ours i showed that house when it was for sale and it was two parcels was there a third one that was added to it one of the parcels has a, a detached accessory no, apartment it's right. three home it's, so it's three parcels three parcels and it actually has four okay. units on it so there can actually be 16 because it has an accessory apartment oh, as well. So there's three parcels, three houses, and an accessory apartment, all of which could have the four unrelated in it for a total of 16. Oh, six, oh, I thought it was only three. So they have an accessory apartment. They can have they got, a, they got 100 over the, they over the garage. They got 100% of the request. Yes. Over and, the garage. Yes. And so an apartment. Uh, of yeah. course, the other parcels as well could down the road build accessory apartments if they would want to. Yes, detached. Detached and yes. do the same thing in those. Yeah, I mean, my recommendation is if you feel strongly, I mean, I is there an AV district in the county that you want this use in or you think that you'd want it in? No. no. Just take it off the table then. Simple yeah, as that. I'm fine What's with the that. use that you're gonna take off? Halfway house. I think, the, I think what Ms. Parker is, we will figure out what they're doing when we make the, we, we've asked uh, Mr. Fullaway to do a site visit. I've invited Ms. Parker to come along with us on that inspection so she can ask whatever questions she may have at that point too. So more than happy to have her come along with us on the inspection with Mark and I. And um, yeah, but we'll, we can, we'll figure out what's going on there. And if it's something that's not the normal rental of a, of a dwelling unit, then yeah, we'll, we'll certainly slap them with a notice of violation and ask them to get approval for another type of use. I believe Ms. Parker's question about the cash flow is a very relevant question. It is. Because I know that if, 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 if insurance, medical insurance, is paying the bills, then that implies that it's not an allowable use. Have you done your research on that? So okay. these are typically 30 days or less days? No. 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 These longer term. <coughs> yes. The first part of the program is a 30 day. That was the halfway house use. The 2.5 doesn't really have a length. Um, it can be 30 days. It could be a year. It just depends on what they decide. Is typically Medicaid what would be paying for? Yeah. This, this. So if Medicaid, which is isn't that federal dollars? If we federal know. If federal <coughs> dollars are paying for the housing that kicks that into a whole nother category yeah. we know that with the 3.5 so with the halfway house that was what was paying for it along with insurance private insurance as well but because this was not part of the special use we don't know exactly who was paying the rent for these and the 2.5 program I think the whole the whole special use permit process for this halfway house has always been very difficult for them to kind of figure out exactly what they're doing here. Uh, we knew the halfway house was happening there. We, we kind of wondered at one time if there was what guidance services was going on and whether a clinic was also being established there. Um, we had our suspicions that those those still, to my knowledge, they're not doing either of those based off of 
what we know now, but I, I don't disagree that there may be some other use going on there. We just need to dig into it some more, and I've certainly asked Mr. Uh, Fullaway to you know, get with me about doing an inspection, uh, and, I, and I sent that email last week to him. I'll and some of it, I know some of it's AV, correct. but some of it's AR, correct? Correct. correct. The homes on the property, three of them are in AV, yeah. and one is split zoned between AR and AV. Yep. Well, I'm, I like your suggestion of removing halfway house from the. I I, I don't know of we a don't store. currently have it. We have halfway house and it's in AV zoning. Okay. So allowed as a special use permit. I just don't know of where, and just thinking of all the AV locations, where you'd want one or it wouldn't affect the people in the area. The state doesn't require us to have it in our ordinance? No. Um, Not yet. I got, the, I was under the impression we, can have, we had to have it, but we could restrict it. That's in a couple of the other. Our restrictions were onerous. It's, it's in C2, isn't it? And it's in a couple other. C, uh, PRD, C2, PCD, PID. It's special use it's in those. available, but just these remote areas like the AVs and the ARs and stuff, you, you know, we would just take it out to where you can't have it there. But I still think it needs to be looked into mm -hmm. As far as like I'm saying, it's kind of kicked to where I would call it a boarding house, which also requires a special use permit. Right, correct. It's not being utilized as a single family dwelling. We, like I said, I've reached out to them and unusually he hasn't responded, so I don't know what's going on with that, but tomorrow we'll certainly try to reach out to them by phone, see if we can get in touch with them. This makes it very clean if you want to get out of the AV district. It makes it very easy, so. All right. So what do you need from us? Just a resolution saying that you want to remove uh, the halfway house as a permissible use in the AV zoning district. I'll make that motion. Second, second motion by Ms. Parker. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Davis. It's a roll call. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Ms. Bansley? Yes. Mr. Sharp? Yes. Mr. Davis? Yes. Mr. Scott? Yes. Yeah. Parker? Yes. Chair votes yes. Thank you. Brings us to number six. Consideration of a resolution requesting a waiver from the State Board of Elections to operate a split precinct for any election held in 2023. That's resolution R06263-08. Mr. Skelly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, with the annexation that recently was voted on by the town and is taking place uh, or coming in effect July 1st, uh, that kicked in our requirement to redistrict again. Um, in the process of redistricting, uh, Ms. Gunter uh, determined that we do have a split precinct at the Bedford Welcome Center between the 51st and the 53rd house districts for the state. Um, to be able to administer that split precinct, we do have to have authorization from the state. So what's before you is a resolution to authorize us to seek that authorization. Any questions? In a motion. Make a motion to approve resolution R06 We have a motion for Mr. Sharp. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Parker. Roll call. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Ms. Bansley? Yes. Mr. Sharp? Yes. Mr. Davis? Yes. Mr. Scott? Yes. Ms. Parker? Yes. Chair votes yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Barbara Gunner. We appreciate you. Sorry to keep you out so late. <laughs> Next up is consideration of a resolution authorizing the execution of a contract with Shintel for a 2023 Vatty Broadband Grant Resolution R06262-09, Mr. Smedley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And before I start here, I'll just note to the uh, gentleman on Founding Way, we will look into your address tomorrow and figure out the broadband situation. It's in the, it's in the Shintel 2020. Yeah, it's in the good area, I think. So that'd be Shintel 2022. Yeah, it's most Shintel. likely so. I yep. looked it up. I, I didn't realize you were still here. All right, well. <laughs> <laughs> so. So on to the uh, project at hand here. Uh, back in May, DHCD notified Bedford County of a 2023 Vatty Grant Award to complete a Chantel broadband project in the Syfax and Charlemont areas. 
Uh, this project would bring broadband to 565 unserved addresses. Total pro project budget is approximately $4.6 million. This VADI grant would fund approximately 1.4 million of that, and Shinto would cover the remaining costs. There is no additional Bedford County match Yay. for this project. Uh, tonight, we're requesting authorization for the county administrator to execute a contract with Shintel. Uh, the contract stipu stipulates a 18-month duration to complete the project. Shintel has already begun upfront work for this project and intends to effectively roll the project into its 2022 project and complete simultaneously. Uh, similar to the 2022 VADI program, uh, once this contract is executed, DHCD can issue its contract for the authority's execution. Uh, we hope to have that contract in front of this board as early as the July 24th meeting. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions about this or any other broadband matters. Mr. Chair, yes. I'd like to make a motion. Oh. A question? Got a question. No Quick question. Can we stipulate that they do the 2022 first? Um, not that I'm being selfish, but I'm being well, <laughs> in, in our discussions with Shintel, uh, we don't expect this work to impact any of uh, the work that they're doing for 2022. A lot of the work uh, coincides. Uh, so effectively, uh, they're out there right now doing engineering work to build the backbone that will serve this area. Um, I know. The, the good area is, is where they're uh, planning on going next in 2022 once they wrap up the Bedford service areas. Um, and based on our latest uh, info from Shinto, uh, they're anticipating starting construction uh, third quarter over there. Then I think they're moving um, to Montvale and, and making their way up to uh, 122. So um, this work should not impact their plans for that. They'll just pair together. All right. I make a motion we approve resolution R062632309. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Scott, seconded by Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Ms. Bansley. Yes. Mr. Sharp. Yes. Mr. Davis. Yes. Mr. Scott. Yes. Ms. Parker. Yes. Chair votes yes. Motion passes. Thank you. That brings us to consideration of a resolution authorizing the purchase and installation of a UPS external bypass and an in row cooling unit in the 911 Sheriff's Office server closet. Resolution R062623 102623 10. Ms. Lowe. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Elizabeth Lowe, IT Director. The uh, proposed uh, agenda item is actually two projects. Uh, first is related to the replacement of the two existing UPSs, the uninterruptible, uninterruptible power supplies. Uh, we have one in the admin data center and another in the Sheriff 911 data center. Both are at the end of life. Um, the new UPS requires the manufacturer to install and configure the external bypass in the UPS for the warranty to be valid. Uh, secondly, when the county uh, new data storage and equipment with the existing data center was fired up in the uh, 911 Sheriff's Office server closet, uh, temperatures rose up to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Now that's very hot for server equipment. Um, Public Works and IT staff met and based on the dimensions of that server closet, there were very limited options to sufficiently power and cool the 911 server closet. Uh, the recommended option is to move forward with the in-row cooling unit, which is designed specifically for data centers. Uh, the proposed vendor, SHI, is priced through a cooperative procurement agreement. They are able to coordinate both the UPS, external bypass installation, as well as the in-row cooling unit. Mrs. Anderson had reviewed the fiscal impact, and the total fiscal impact for this item is $115,629, previously funded Funding for the service storage upgrade was $491,000, and the replacement of the main UPS is $34,000, was approved and appropriated to the general fund CIP. The remaining balance for the service storage upgrade project is $61,001, and for the main UPS replacement project is $11,083. Therefore, the total funding of $72,084 is available in the general fund CIP to offset the additional costs. Staff is recommending the use of contingency fund to fund the remaining $43,545. Okay, any questions for Elizabeth? 
All right. Is there a motion? Yes, I'll make a motion to approve resolution R062623-10. We have a motion by Mr. Sharp. Is there a second? A second. Second by Mr. Johnson. This is a roll call. Mr. Davis. Yes. Mr. Scott. Yes. Ms. Parker. Yes. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Ms. Bansley. Yes. Mr. Sharp. Yes. Chair votes yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you Next up, consideration of a resolution authoriz authorizing the extension of contractual agreements for solid waste and recycling hauling services. Resolution R062623-01. Mr. Kaufman. Good evening. First, I would like to say to Mr. Johnson, Ms. Bansley, and Ms. Parker, I turned the thermostat up two degrees this afternoon. I will do more <laughs> next meeting because clearly it was not enough. So I just wanted to cover that first. Um, I don't know what's wrong with them. That, I can, they got a lot more hair than I do. Maybe that cooling system should be taken to the UPS. That's right. We can put the, we can put the <laughs> servers in here and it might be okay. Um, Anyway, presenting for your consideration tonight, um, Republic Service and Base Trash Removal currently services our solid waste and recycling hauling services. Uh, this contract is previously solicited. We, it is up for renewal this year, um, July 31st. We recommend uh, continuing it for the next two year extension period. Uh, the only real caveat to this is uh, Republic has asked to eliminate what was essentially an artificial 3% CPI cap on that contractual services uh, based on some of the costs um, that we've run into, the inflationary pressures that they've had on there for the, um, in the last couple of years. Uh, based on a rough calculation, you're looking at an additional $20,000 to $30,000 cost per year with that CPI adjustment in there. Um, however, the flip side of that is uh, they notifies us of this in April. It takes about 18 months to procure these services and, and the uh, rentals for the equipment and everything. I would recommend proceeding with this. And in six months, we're going to go ahead and start soliciting for the next round of hauling services procurement anyway. Any questions for Doug? When you're this late, this late up, you're about going to get anything you ask for. <laughs> kind, of, kind of like being, at the, being the last man at the auction. That's right. That's right. Get whatever right. you bid on, right? So, so, you're, you're, so I, I heard you say you recommended we approve this, Doug. Yes, sir. If there's no further discussion, I would move that we approve resolution R062623-011. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Davis. Second. Second by Mr. Scott. Mr. Davis. Yes. Mr. Scott. Yes. Ms. Parker. Yes. Mr. Johnson. <clears throat> yes. Ms. Bansley. Yes. Mr. Sharp. Yes. Chair votes yes. Motion passes. Then we have 9G item, which was pulled from the consent agenda. It's consideration of a resolution authorizing the purchase of a vehicle for the Director of Emergency Management. Resolution R062623-12. Yes, thank you. Um, so this one is uh, for consideration uh, to authorize county staff to purchase a Ford Expedition for the new Director of Emergency Management position. Uh, during the CIP process, this was uh, put into the CIP to allow for the new vehicle. Since we knew we had a new position, we had to procure something to provide appropriate service for that position. Um, based on my discussions with the new Director of Emergency Management, uh, science restrictions and everything necessitated having a large SUV in order to carry equipment, be able to tow adequately, access possible remote sites. And uh, working with him, we landed on a suburban expedition, something to that effect. At that point, I went, uh, contacted some of the dealers that have state contracts. Uh, Sheehy Ford in Richmond has a state contract uh, Ford Expedition remaining, and the total vehicle cost for that was $54,197.40. I'm going to go buy it. Mm -hmm. The state contracts are, uh, actually this is not state contract, this is a cooperative procurement with the city of Chesapeake, but the cooperative procurement contracts are quite, quite competitive. We could not buy, 
we would be hard pressed to buy a used one with less than 50,000 miles for the same price. Yeah. I just had a couple questions. You said it was from the budget and the vehicle replacement fund. So this is a new position. So whose vehicle is being replaced? Uh, I think it was just added to fund 15. That, that's that just, uh, that's just what it. the fund is called. It's not a, it's just the vehicle fund. So, so no one, so it's no one like fire and rescue aren't losing a vehicle. No, no, no. Or, We're not no. swapping this out for another one. This yeah. isn't it. Uh, fire and rescue does this too with additional vehicles. If they need an extra one for brush fires or something like that, they would add it through the same fund. It's basically the fund that supplies the vehicles for the county. Yeah, sheriff vehicles, DSS vehicles, uh, planning and zoning, all those vehicles are in that. New vehicles are in that fund, and this one was added this year. And it was also said that it was needed to, I'm trying to find where it is, to um, tow trailers, um, carry equipment. Is that something that's done routinely in that position or during an emergency? Uh, I would have suspected that would mostly be done during an emergency. So when, where is this going to be sitting when it's not an emergency? Well, I could let Mr. Roby speak to that if he would like to. Is this to, not or? going to be used except in an emergency to tow equipment? I did some research on this through VDEM uh, and FEMA. And I base some of this on lessons learned. Uh, two FEMA uh, advisors pulled up this week and helped me out with uh, some policies. And they're both driving big SUVs. They have to be able to get off the road. They have to be able to respond to not only emergencies, but if we're doing training or anything like that and we need trailers moved or, or I need to go pick up a generator, I can't be pulling fire and rescue off of their vehicles and say, hey, can you run down here and pick up a generator at this location or, or trailers at this location? <clears throat> Basically what they said, if you get into the Explorers, they ended up having to get trailers because they didn't have enough room to put their equipment on. They're developing equipment right now for me so I don't have to go out here and just buy willy-nilly equipment that I don't need. And that's what I told them to do. Give me a list and let's, let's stay within our means and you know, research is being done on this. I'm not just going out here and buying a vehicle. The other plan was, was it's not rip snorting up and down the road. And uh, we're not staying within the county policy of turning it in. I want to keep this thing for 10 years. You take care of it, you should be able to keep, you know, keep it for 10 years, 300,000 miles. So um, it'll be used at any time for anything, for any purpose. You know, if fire and rescue calls, it's not, it didn't fall in my category, but I'm at a scene with them. I want to be able to help them and not pull them offline. Just some questions I had left. It, it was brought to consent agenda. We'd never discussed it. I just wanted a discussion on it. Thank you. Any other questions on it? <clears throat> Just to clarify, this is going to be a vehicle that you drive daily, correct? I'm going to call 247. Yes, sir. Okay. I'm sorry, all we could give you is a Ford. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion. <laughs> all right, we have a motion by Mr. Scott. I'm still thinking about our GM products that Mr. Scott made. Make a motion, we'll adjourn. <laughs> we have a motion by Mr. Scott. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Parker. This is the roll call. Mr. Dale. Motion we adjourn. Was you listening? I couldn't hear you. I was <laughs> so we getting ready to adjourn. <laughs> I, I didn't make a motion yet. I thought you did. I said I make a motion we adjourn. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that we approve re resolution R06263-12. All right. Second. Uh, Mr. Johnson and Ms. Parker. All right, Mr. Davis. Yes. Mr. Scott. Yes. Ms. Parker. Yes. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Ms. Bansley. Yes. Mr. Sharp. Yes. Chair votes yes. Thank you. Board committee reports, none. <laughs> well, I, I will say that there was a public works committee meeting earlier before this meeting discussed. Um, DSS. Yeah, DSS, we won't cover it a little bit. Yeah, we um, talked about DSS um, site selection for a possible building location, um, as well as potential decal system um, for the collection sites and refuse. And we have some staff staff due diligence to do 
um, before we come back to the Public Works Committee, and hopefully that will be up for a full board comment here in the next couple months. Okay. Board comments? Are there anybody just got something burning that can't wait? I do. Okay. Um, I was working at a job in Franklin County a week or two back and uh, had a building inspector come out there and turn us down with no good reason for getting ready to, for a bonding inspection. And uh, so I was kind of frustrated and trying to figure out how to deal with this because I've never had anything like this happen to me before in 40 years of building pools. So I called Jordan and he put me through to Will and Will cited the code that clearly proved that I was right and my project should be approved. And I just want to let you guys know that, that I, I was very pleased with the performance and the service I got from our building and planning department. And, and one other thing uh, I'm going to say, um, in the um, original, in the consent agenda, I want it to be clear that I did not approve the hotel being put on the D-Day Memorial. I don't approve of giving an entity over a million dollars in tax incentives over 10 years. That's what the town did in addition to giving this entity three acres to build this hotel on, uh, which winds up to being you know, clearly well over a million dollars in incentives. Um, and also, I was not in favor of the county supervisors. Again, I was opposed to it, giving this entity $600,000 in tax credits over eight years. This board recently voted to technically increase the tax rate on Bedford County citizens, and yet they turn around and, and give away $600,000 in taxes over eight years to an entity without even um, se seeking out another bid, perhaps somebody who would actually pay for this project, this hotel. And furthermore, I was really irritated about the town offering over a million dollars in, in credits and incentives when they had annexed part of, of the county. In other words, effectively doubling the tax rate of Bedford County citizens, yet turning around and giving an entity to build a hotel, which, which effectively is going to pay for that hotel for that guy. And maybe or maybe not he will succeed. I don't know. But this county already had two uh, national chain hotels, and I drive by them every day, and most of the time they're half to two-thirds occupied. Um, and, I, and I don't think anyone made any effort to, to offer these folks uh, any, any payments or, or credits when they built their hotels. So I'm, I just want to make it public, uh, my feelings on this. Okay. Any other board comments? All right. Robert. Um, I have nothing else other than, I know it's getting late, but we do need, I would request to have a closed session to discuss appointments to the uh, Board of Equalization. Mm -hmm. Mr. Skelly. Need a motion pursuant to section 2.2-3711A1, discussion of potential appointments. Move. Mr. Johnson with the motion, second. Is there a second? Second, second by Ms. Parker. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? We're in closed session.
Live? Good. Okay. I'm looking for a motion to come out of closed session. So moved. Ms. Parker with the first uh, motion. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Davis. All in favor signify by saying aye. Uh, any opposed? We're back in open session. And whereas the Bedford County Board of Supervisors convened a closed meeting pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, and whereas Section 2.2-3712 of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by the Bedford County Board of Supervisors that such a closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law, now, therefore, it be resolved that the Beaver County Board of Supervisors does hereby certify that to the best of each member's knowledge. Only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which this certification resolution applies. And only such public business matters that were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting was heard, discussed, or considered by the Beaver County Board of Supervisors. Mr. Johnson. Hold a candle to you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Ms. Bainsley. Mr. Sharp. Yes. Ms. Parker. Yes. Mr. Scott. Yes. Mr. Davis. Yes. Mr. Chair. Yes. So certified. All right, so we're moving on to the next item, which is board appointments to the Board of Equalization. Mr. Hiss, if you could read off the names. Yes. Um, the names uh, being put forward for appointment are Wendy Witt, James Meyer, Virginia Lynch, Catherine Jones, Laura Bowblitz, and as an alternate, Brian Hughes. Okay. You've heard the names. Is there a motion to accept? So moved. So moved by Ms. Bansley. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Parker. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? And it passes. Mr. Skelly, anything? No, sir. All right. Board information, no more. Mr. Hiss, any dates that we need to be, have burned in our mind? Uh, just our, we'll only have one meeting in July. That'll be uh, July uh, 24th. So uh, we'll see you then. Enjoy right. break. Can, can we try to make that meeting run later than this one? We'll do our we'll make do a our motion to adjourn. Yeah, I was going to say we have a dangling motion from Mr. Uh, like <laughs> Scott. <laughs> Is there a second? Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Y'all have a happy.